Um, I want to uh, briefly introduce uh, Dave Berardo. Uh, Dave is the person uh, at NSF without whom this could not have happened. And um, I, I'm not sure I know what I'm saying, speaking about when I say this, but I think uh, Dave went out on a limb uh, several years ago when from the Paleoclimate Program Division's uh, uh, limited funding, he decided to fund uh, this bringing together of scientists and journalists that we've been doing over the past several years. It's certainly not the standard kind of program NSF uh, has funded in the past, although hopefully it will in the future. Uh, so we're enormously grateful, uh, Tony and I, and, and I think the scientists and journalists who have been part of our program have been enormously thankful to Dave for uh, his imagination and creativity and backbone in being able to, uh, to fund this kind of uh, a communications initiative out of the Paleo Climate Program. Uh, Dave. Thank you, Bud, and good afternoon. I uh, want to thank the uh, Woodrow Wilson Center for hosting this final meeting. It's, uh, it's a great facility here. It's um, much classier than the other digs, many of the other digs that we had in some of the other, other, other meetings. But uh, I just very briefly, uh, before we get to, the, uh, to, to Andy's uh, talk this afternoon, just wanted to uh, talk, uh, express, uh, give you my view, view on some of this. Um, yes, we funded this through the Paleo Climate Program. Um, and lots of questions even today so saying, well, it's sort of curious that the Paleo Climate Program would fund this. And I, I actually don't see why that's so curious. Uh, it's uh, paleoclimatology is very much involved in the climate change. Uh, we're not going to call it the debate anymore, apparently. We're going to call it the climate change uh, discussion that we're having nationally, internationally. So it's important to have these, uh, to get some ideas on communication. But I think one thing, uh, I guess this one reason that, I, that the science program should fund uh, events like these is simply, is something I think uh, Woodrow Wilson said uh, best. He urged against um, either following or, um, or offering hasty counsel. And he said the important thing was to provide light and not heat. And there's a lot of heat in this issue. And, you know, no pun intended. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of discussion around, about this, a lot of people uh, engaged in the, in the search for the answers to this uh, important environmental question that the scientific community itself raised. So I think that events like this uh, uh, do provide a certain amount of light as opposed to the heat um, of passion on, on, this, on the subject. And these workshops, as Tony uh, hoped, uh, this is not the end, it's, it's, it's pretty much the beginning and, and this, this uh, workshop uh, funded through, uh, through the Paleoclimate Program and through NSF is, is really meant to link with other things that the program has funded, such as the American Meteorological Society Summer Policy Colloquium that Bill Hook in the back um, runs. And that's a, a very unique event where uh, every year uh, for about 10 days, a group of uh, 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 mid-career uh, scientists and, and young uh, young level scientists, graduate students come into Washington for an immersion class in, in, in policy and actually politics. And Bill gets a good cadre of, of, of uh, speakers from around town, and senior administration, uh, senior administration officials, uh, senior scientists to come and talk about science and policy and how it all fits together and where it works and where it doesn't work. So this is meant to, um, to integrate with that. And I would hope that, that uh, Bud and Tony uh, would take that, take that seriously. I would also uh, urge that, um, you know, I've been to a couple of the, the seminars. And at NSF, you know, we, we, don't, we don't issue contracts like some other, uh, other agencies. We don't develop an idea and then search for people who will help us. Uh, achieve whatever goals we're looking for. We, this is very much a, a bottoms-up, grassroots type of thing. So, uh, you know, Bud and his colleagues at the Metcalf came to me with this idea and had it reviewed among peers and decided that we should fund it. But it's very much your, your project, just like any other research project. We don't get involved in it. So that's why I haven't, sometime, I haven't come to all these things. I need to stay a little bit away from them. But I would urge you, though, that 
the product that comes out of these, the series of s workshops needs to be aimed at the working scientist and not the presidents of media outlets and the chancellors of universities. Those aren't people that need this kind of information as much as the rank and file scientists. So whatever you come out with has to be something that somebody who's in the trenches working in science. And by the way, um, you know, the science community is more, this you know, climate science community or paleoclimate science community is more than just the, the few stars or the rock stars that you see. There's legions of you know, anonymous researchers who just work, do great work, and you never hear about them. And these are the kinds of the people that need uh, to understand the, the, the relationship between media and science. Now, through, throughout some of the, these uh, workshops, I've noticed the biggest theme um, that I see is, is one of a cultural issues. And those are trying to understand the culture of the media and journalism versus the culture of science. And very, very different cultures. Um, for example, uh, we had a very robust discussion at, uh, at uh, University of Washington precipitated by a very just simple comment. Uh, scientists were, you know, if you've had these workshops, they, they, they first started sitting across the table from each other and eventually started integrating, sitting next to each other. But an issue was raised about scientists getting angry about being misquoted. Why are scientists angry about mis being misquoted? Well, we said, well, because we view ourselves as scientists as educators. We don't like to mislead our students or the people we're talking to. And, and we said, just sort of naively, well, is, you know, doesn't the media see themselves as educators? And we got into this really loud discussion that you know, the media did not see themselves, the journalists did not necessarily see themselves as educators. They saw themselves as reporters. So we said, well, well how's that work? I mean, when I open up the paper, the newspaper, I, I want to learn something. I also want to know what's going on in the world, but I also want an analysis of some kind. And some of the journalists said, well, yeah, but we just want to tell you what's going on. And I said, well, what could it, you know, we also said, well, what's good is that? What's the difference between the front page and the newspaper and the gossip column? And through a series of discussions, we realized as scientists that, you know, there was a part of the newspaper and some stories that are clearly meant to educate and to inform. Uh, educate, and then there's parts of a newspaper that we could agree that we're more about information, you know, about what's going on about town, what's this, what's that, and it seems like a simple distinction, but it was a huge one for the scientists, and I'm not sure we've really gotten over uh, over that over that feeling, and I don't think we've come to a conclusion with that discussion, but that's a real sort of a, a mismatch for scientists and journalists because we have we have different uh, different cultures in that regard, but. Having said that, scientists think that often we think that we should be able to call up a, a journalist or, or we, we are contacted by a journalist and they should just record what we say and then report it like that, uh, that they work for us and that's the way it goes. And we realize now that the journalists are, value their independence as highly as the scientists value their independence. So you can tell them whatever you want and they're going to look at it from their perspective and they're going to hopefully quote you correctly, but they're gonna analyze it a little bit differently. And in the scientific community, we have a hard time. You know, we're mostly trained. We're not trained to communicate well. We're not trained to even understand financial spreadsheets at the basic level. I mean, these are sort of issues we have, but, but we, we tend to work in very small groups. We tend to communicate directly with our colleagues in that group. And then secondly, our students in that group. And then there's this huge gulf beyond that of where the public comes in, and that's the reality of it. So we have some issues with that. Uh, another cultural issue I think bears uh, discussion is, you know, when a physician, a licensed physician, these are people licensed by the, by the state, when they make a mistake, somebody gets hurt potentially and they have a, they're accountable to their licensing authority, they're also, they also can get sued, okay? There's an accountability there for what you do. When an engineer designs a building and it falls apart, same thing. They're accountable to, you know, people get hurt, they're accountable to a licensing authority, possibly get sued. When a journalist gets it wrong, you know, their credibility's on the line, sometimes they can get fired, they can also get sued. 
if they don't uh, follow a story and they say something that's defamatory. What happens to a climate scientist when he or she gets it wrong? What, what do we do? Well, we write another paper and says we were wrong about this and now we're right about that. I mean, there's, a, there's this issue of accountability and we're, once again, it's a cultural issue of, you know, this explains partly why scientists, you know, uh, speak the way they do, operate the way they do. It's, it's an issue of, in a way, who's gonna, you know, what's the downside to this thing? You know, so uh, it's, we don't talk about it, but we should, we should. Um, I think going into the workshops, I think it's fair to say that uh, journalists would have characterized the scientists as inarticulate, and uh, scientists would have characterized journalists as deaf, because they, you know we tell them things, they get it wrong. There's a problem there. Um, before we started these workshops, um, I would have, if you had asked me what a news hole was, I would have thought it was a pejorative term for a journalist. Uh, <laughs> Now, now I find out it's a pejorative term for an editor or somebody. So, and there was this strange topic of of uh, pegboarding, you know, putting a story. What are you going to hang this story on? We have no concept of this in science. And I think, lastly, I'd like to say that I think scientists unfairly want to use the media as a fast lane to um, legislators. They want to do their science. They want to talk to a journalist and they want the journalist to write a story that changes legislators' minds on an issue. And I think, unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. Uh, to use someone else, you know, to use journalists as, a, as a, this fast lane of legislators is a cop-out on your own civic duty. And we've talked around that at several workshops that came up again here. There is no easy way. If you, if you, are, if you feel you know something about climate change, you need to get uh, that information directly to those who make policy decisions. You cannot use the media as a proxy for that. It's just not fair to them, and it won't work. It's, it's obviously not working out very well. So that's all I wanted to say, and, and, and now uh, this is the really good part of uh, the lunch break. We have uh, very, we are privileged today to have Andy Revkin um, to come and talk to us uh, about his experiences in, in science, journalism, and communication, and also uh, in the context of a new book that he's written called The North Pole Was Here. Uh, Andy has been involved in, I mean, you can read his biography, it's a good biography there, but he's been involved in, in environmental and science issues for over uh, a, a quarter of a century. Uh, he has a, a bachelor's degree in biology from Brown University and a master's in journalism from Columbia, and he's taught it as an adjunct at Columbia University. Um, He's been at the New York Times since 1995. He has uh, received many uh, professional awards uh, for his works. He's received the National Academy's Communication Award. He's received uh, twice the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science uh, Journalism Award. He has written um, a series of books. Uh, the North Pole Was Here is the most recent. He also wrote The Burning Season, uh, one of his earliest uh, works, and also Global Warming, Understanding the Forecast. Before uh, Andy came to the New York Times, he was senior editor of Discover um, and staff writer for the LA Times and a senior writer at Science Digest. Andy. Groundhog Day. Anyone seen that movie? Several times. Yeah. <laughs> I, I recently, uh, I used to have a copy of um, my first cover story on climate change um, in my attic, and I couldn't find, I can't find it, so I finally had to call Discover Magazine to get them to fax me over a copy. Um, it, this, I'm just going to read really quick excerpt, because I want to race, race you to the North Pole here. Um, on June 23rd, the United States sizzled as thermometers topped 100 degrees in 45 cities from coast to coast, 102 in Sacramento, 103 in Lincoln, Nebraska, 100 whatever in Richmond, Virginia. For the nation's heartland, the searing heat, I'm getting older, was accompanied by a ruinous drought that ravaged crops and t prompted talked of a dust bowl to rival that of the 1990s. Heat waves and droughts are nothing new, of course, but on that stifling June day, a top atmospheric scientist testifying on Capitol Hill had a disturbing message for his senatorial audience. Get used to it. It was Jim Hansen, of course. 
This was 1988. Um, and you know, I, I went on for about 5,000 words there, and I look at it, and every single word there I could publish in the New York Times this week, essentially. Um, the word Katrina wasn't in this story, but <laughs> Carrie Emanuel was in this story. Um, so, and there is a somewhat of a deja vu sense, a little bit, to the, the current. Uh, we, we don't know yet whether it's a trend. By the way, it's, we were talking before about this burst of media interest, but is it a trend? Or is it a cycle? It sounds familiar. Is this a hockey stick or is this a, you know, a, a warped stick that will go in another direction? I'm not sure we totally know that yet. Um, I, I do think in the short run we're in for an, you know, a climate-driven media uh, feeding opportunity that will go on for a little while, and not a frenzy. So, um, but I wanted to sort of take you on my trajectory from 1988. Actually, 1985 was my first climate cover story. That was on nuclear winter, the inverse of uh, this thing. And try to just give you a sense of what, where, what I think can, journalism can bring to this, what journalism can't bring to this, and what uh, scientists, the best thing scientists I think can do is just be more transparent and, and let us into your world, not when the uh, AAAS uh, Eureka Alert website has the abstract coming on your paper that's just coming out that week, but in the off time, when you're hunkered down doing the science, because and one reason I've written this book for younger kids, for younger people, uh, well, for anyone 10 and up, that even includes senators, um, um, is, is I think we really don't know how science works in this country. It's that simple. And until you understand that science is trajectory, it's not the punctuation marks, it's not the papers, it's where, are we, where is it taking us, that, then, then we're not going to get significant adherence to the idea that something has changed, that there's a human influence on climate and on the fate of the, uh, the earth. So here we are. Um, climate has been in the news even before 1988. This was 1890. One of the wonderful things about being in the New York Times, especially in the digital age, is that we've digitized all those, those crispy brown clippings. Uh, they go back to 1851. Um, and I looked through a lot of them when I was doing my book on the North Pole because I wanted to see the first coverage we did of the, the Arctic. Here's the story, 1890. I love this. I live in the Hudson Valley, right? And here, the, the big news in 1890 about climate was that the, the ice crop in the Hudson Valley had, had failed again. The ice crop in the Hudson Valley had failed again. You know, in the winter, you cut the ice, you put it in the barn, you put a bunch of sawdust over it, and then that's your ice for the summer. They were importing ice from Norway for several years in a row. This is a crisis. Uh, what's going on with climate? No mention there of anthropogenic change, but we'll get to that. And then there was this headline, which is uh, on our website when I did that story that got under the uh, skin of some environmentalists in April that yelling fire on a hot planet. Um, I, I noticed this clip and we put it, posted it on our site. Next great deluge forecast by science. Uh, you, you know, again, there, this is about the natural cycles that are out there. And then 1956, finally we see the human influence coming in on the, the year of my birth um, by the wonderful and, and forgotten Valdemar Kempfart, who I would love to have known. This guy, I mean, again, he wrote stories that could be in the Times today, and I'll prove it to you. Um, we are, we're doing this energy challenge series this year, and um, I want to take you down through this story. Um, okay, here we go. Last paragraph of the story. Coal and oil are still plentiful and cheap in many parts of the world, and there is every reason to believe that both will be consumed by industry so long as it pays to do so. That's, I guarantee that's actually been in our pages in the last few months as we've written about coal in China and, and all this. I mean... It's amazing to me, again, the, the, the uh, Groundhog Day, deja vu aspect of a lot of this. And you've seen this trajectory, again, of understanding. There, there was that blip of stuff in the nine, early 70s about the next ice age, and a lot of the contrarian skeptic denialists, whatever you want to call them, have said, oh, the media, see, they were just hyping that then, and now they're hyping this now. But that kind of was a blip. It went away. And the thing about the trajectory on the human forcing on the climate system has been unidirectional. And there's a very boring but very good book to read about it called The Discovery of Global Warming by Spencer Weird. I, I hope he's not here. <laughs> I reviewed it for the Times, and I did not call it boring in the review. It's an essential book. <laughs> you get it? <laughs> it? And you can find it online. It's, it's, it's all there on hypertext. So um, my, my journalism career, I started out uh, wanting to be a scientist. I grew up in Rhode Island, and I loved the ocean, and I, I was... Um, a big fan of Jacques Cousteau. As a kid, I watched all those documentaries, I read his books, and, and you know, all he had to do to, to make me want to be a scientist was stick a camera underwater and go, ooh la la. <laughs> and, and that was it for me. I just, 
I really wanted to be a marine biologist. Um, my, my fourth grade dreams of being a paleontologist went away. And, and I got to Brown University, and, and I was getting out of Brown University, and I realized I didn't have the guts or whatever to get a PhD and just study one thing. That was way too rigid for me. Some of you may have heard me speak on this before, but I've, I've learned since that I was too ADD to get a PhD. <laughs> and, but of course, for the journalists in the room, uh, how many of you uh, think you're ADD? <laughs> or have been diagnosed. <laughs> My sister-in-law teaches learning disabled, le kids with learning issues, and she, she pegged me right away. You know, kind of like this, wow, this is all interesting and important. <laughs> so finally, I, I, I abandoned science. I, went, I was overseas for a couple of years. I saw some amazing things after college, and then I, I came back to the, uh, the real world. Uh, that's Los Angeles for anyone who can't quite see. Down, down low, you can actually see the Los Angeles Times, where I worked for one brief year in the, in the 1980s. Um, I, I, got, I got a journalism degree, started out at Science Digest, and um, the LA Times was going to start a science section like the New York Times had, because it, you know, the, the it seems smart, so why don't we do it too? And um, they hired me to be uh, one of their new staff writers, but I was kind of put in the San Fernando Valley initially while they were getting ready to start the section. And then their bean counters realized, well, you know, we're already sell selling computer ads in the sports section. What do we need a science section for? End of science section. <laughs> And this relates a lot to the journalism trends we heard about this morning. If you think this is a new trend, the idea that uh, science doesn't necessarily sell, um, or you, you have to have a, a, a profit logic to a medium to make it work. Um, that was my first experience with that. And I ended up stranded in the San Fernando Valley writing about Martina Navratilova's lost dogs. That was a running story. It was like a three-day story. Martina Navratilova's lost dogs, they're still lost. <laughs> and and I'm, I'm realizing like I'm, I'm, I've gone to hell. <laughs> I also had to write about a uh, uh, guy, he was in the James Bond movie, he was a former professional tennis player, Indian guy, VJ something or other, and um, he, he, he had a big zoning issue about putting lights on his tennis court. I had to write about that too. So I, I thought, this is not my career path, I've got to get out of here. So I came back to, the, um, new, to New York and ended up at Discover where I started writing about climate. And, um, and my first, the, the 1988 was a, an instructive year. Think, you think climate these days, you're thinking hurricanes and, and melting ice. In 1988, it was burning tropics and, and heat waves. Um, but it, it built the same pulse of coverage. There was, and it had all the elements that we had because of Katrina. We had, in, in 1988, it was pictures of a smoke cloud the size of India over the Amazon basin coming from the space shuttle, and thousands of fires burning. You could see on satellite images by, by Jim Tucker and others at NASA, um, this constellation of fires in the Amazon, and, and we had this heat wave in the north, and it, it all made for a great story. And uh, colleagues of mine and others started putting two and two together, global warming tied to fires in the Amazon. It was all hot. You had, you had fires, and you had a warming atmosphere. And um, it had good pictures, which was great for TV and all that stuff. And then you, even better, it had, it had martyrs. Uh, down there um, in the Amazon, uh, actually, uh, I've been using these slides as long as Al Gore has. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> this is the, these are the Compton Tucker shots of, uh, of uh, the uh, Rondonia, uh, giving you a sense of the pace of change in the Amazon. And this is a picture I took when I finally got down there, um, and it was a human story. There's a message in this. Human stories are stories that are easier to tell and easier for people to engage on. Uh, there was a guy named Chico Mendez who was a labor organizer, rubber tapper, uh, a failed politician in, in a tiny corner of the Amazon who figured out that if he came out of the Amazon, that was the only way to stop the road construction because the money, the checks that were coming to let Brazil do that were coming from places like Washington. So he was sort of this um, Davy Crockett, some kind of figure like that, and he came out and he got murdered, and that, that made for something that, that we, the media up here, could, could explain to Americans in a way that, that uh, would catch their attention. This was a Western, Wild West story that happened to involve a very rare and beautiful, uh, a beautiful part of the uh, global environment. So I went down there, and, and you see a scene like this, and it really gets your attention when you think that that was a rainforest just a few years earlier. And, uh, and it's just so sear and dry. Now there's some studies coming out right now about if you have a few, few um, extreme drought years in the Amazon, you may actually end up with a scene like this without even having any uh, chainsaws. We don't know yet. The science is a little complicated. So there, there you had all the elements again. You had, you had the fires, and you had the burning, and you had, vi and you had uh, global warming to relate, it to, uh, our, our, to relate it to us at home. And then you had a guy getting murdered, which was great, because we all like conflict. We like bad guys, good guys. 
it, it had all the elements of a story, and actually that's the only reason there was a book about it, and actually several books. And I, I wrote one, and by some weird miracle, it came back into print recently, which is, again, totally bizarre, but uh, there you go. And finally, um, I was writing a, uh, then I wrote my first book on global warming in 1990, well, it came out in 1992. Stupidly, uh, uh, you know, marketing wizard that I am, it came out right after Mount Pinatubo had blown. You heard about that <laughs> earlier, which uh, didn't do much for the, you know, the global climate cooled for several years, and uh, so did the issue, especially because the desert storm had also just happened, and, and so we were focused on oil in the Middle East, not on, on things like global warming. So I needed a job. My third book kind of went sour, and I, the local paper had an opening in the metro section, and that's when I first got to the New York Times. And my first week was the Oklahoma City bombing. So, uh, I, And then there were many other things that got in the way of covering the environment. Uh, off and on, Flight 800 fell out of the sky 10 years ago. That was right after I started. And so I became an expert on a lot of things. And still, though, in the back of my mind was this goal of writing more about um, the environment. And I focused on regional issues first and then eventually uh, back to my old beat. Um, but learning the, the norms of a newspaper was, and I'm still learning the norms of a newspaper, I still feel 11 years and a thousand stories after I joined the New York Times, I still look at it like the first time I got into the depths of the Amazon rainforest. It's kind of this weird culture and everything's competitive, just sort of like, I recently figured out the analogy, it is like a rainforest because in the rainforest all these plants, all these diverse plants are vying for the light. And in a newspaper all these diverse ideas are vying for the front page. And it's the same thing. It's competitive, and, and some the plants that win are the stronger ones. The, the, where the, the, the analogy breaks down, though, because the plants that win aren't just the stronger ones. They're the ones that look familiar the, um, to the gatekeepers we've been talking about, the who are not here. The, the, uh, the reasons that a, um, a, a story that's nuanced, that involves uncertainty, um, that is multidisciplinary, um, that is a future-oriented story don't get into a paper readily is because you're competing with all the things we already know. You're competing with the Yankees and you're competing with the Wall Street and you're competing with drugs for cancer that we all care about and you're competing with um, fitness questions and pop psychology and of course then the no-brainers, you know, earthquakes, the tsunami I spent two days writing about last week and um, and that we don't, you know, what tsunami? Oh, that one that only killed 500 people. Um, and uh, and uh, war. And uh, that is not a competition where a story on climate change is going to win the day if it's true to the nuances of climate change. So you end up with a lot of courage being either inadequate, well, I won't make the judgment of inadequately played, but played on the inside, not played uh, where sometimes the reporter feels it should be played. In fact, someone read the, 19, the, the um, 2001 third assessment summary statement. Who was that? Richard, you did. Um, that, when that assessment came out, and I had it, I had it not only, I had it leaked to me in advance, so I, it, that was a scoop and an exclusive, and to me, the first really definitive statement by scientists without caveat that humans were exerting a, an influence on the climate system. I mean, if that isn't a page one story to me, I don't know what a page one story is. Humans are in, have become a planetary scale influence, um, and it ended up on page A17. And so I, did a, I went back to that front page recently, and it, the things that were on the front page today, you know, looking back, were pretty silly. Hillary Clinton had to give back some money to a, a Muslim don group that donated her some money, and uh, there was a whole bunch of things like that, just total, you know, the usual stuff. And uh, this story that where scientists finally kind of got over their caveats <laughs> wasn't there. So, and by the way, one of the norms of journalism, which I'll get to in a second, is, is exemplified in what I wrote up there on the top of the PowerPoint. I hate using words on PowerPoint. Um, uh, an editor, when I first got there, I got used to the idea that, you know, journalism is definitely a hurry up kind of job. And, and one of my editors was, was from the Midwest, and, said, and uh, one of my, my first stories there, probably story number eight or something, he was leaning over my shoulder, you know, it was just on some totally inconsequential hearing on a Hudson River Park you know, Revkin, this ain't no seed catalog. And I'm like, yes, I know, I know, it's the New York Times. But I got it done. <laughs> so this, these, these next three slides are for the scientists in the audience. I do speak PowerPoint. I've been learning this for a little while. It's a language that's uh, you know, odd for some of us. But So the, the PowerPoints that actually have words in them are for the scientists in the audience. They're the tyrannies of news, right? This is how you're supposed to do it. You have to repeat each word that's on the screen. <laughs> 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 Tyranny of the peg. <laughs> 
you know, as someone just said a minute ago, that news is something that happened today, not something that might happen uh, in my child's lifetime. Um, earthquakes, well, you know, the space-time thing, the Revkin, the Saint No Seed catalog thing, the balance thing, which has been going, going over here at length, as it should be. And, and here's your pop quiz, Exxon Valdez, non-point source pollution, which wins? <laughs> Tsunami, sea level rise. They're both about this, but which, which is news and which is snooze? Uh, it's, again, it's a no-brainer. But the slow drips can matter. You know, there, um, a few years ago, I wrote a story about a National Academy's study on, on non-point source pollution, the drips at the gas station, the slow drip. Um, and it's like one and a half Exxon Valdez is a year on east, east coastal, American coastal beaches, uh, I mean coastal marshes and places like that. So it's a lot of oil, but it's kind of, you know, the invisible little drip. It's not, it's not some drunken ship captain uh, turning left when he should have turned right in a pristine ecosystem in Alaska. And then I've been trying for several years to get in a really solid long story into the paper on the uh, losses around the world right now from indoor air pollution from the two billion people who go out every day, collect firewood and dung, and burn it for, to cook their meals. And uh, as they aspire to the fossil fuel life that we all have, um, the, who in the world should, says that they should be locked into a world of having to go out, spend several hours walking around collecting sticks or dung and uh, to cook their meals and dying in the process from breathing, breathing polluted indoor air? That's part of the, the energy question that has not yet really been addressed very effectively. And so you have a choice. You can, with, a, with an issue like that, you can ignore it, which is usually what we do, or you can hype it, as uh, my own newspaper did in the year 2000, um, uh, which damaged us in, in a bad way when another reporter, um, who has won a Pulitzer Prize and, and written some fantastic science stories, wrote that for the first time, open water at the North Pole. You probably, some of you remember this front page, not just front page, two thirds of the left-hand side of the front page. Really good picture, we love pictures. It was the bow of the ship that the tourists were on, including a couple of scientists, neither of whom was a climatologist or, a, or, a, or an Arctic expert, who had been on this trip and came back and set, spoke to a reporter at the paper and said, you know what, there was open water at the North Pole, a really big area. You know, not, we're not talking like a little patch, but a big area. Major front page story uh, generated all kinds of great cartoons and follow-up coverage. And, and it finally, it seemed like the moment, the thing. This, you know, there's the peg, open water at the North Pole. And uh, then, of course, it turned out that it was wrong. At least the first 200 words of the story were wrong. The rest of the story was great. Four, 800, 900 words of really good, solid journalism with all the nuances, and you know, we don't really know, but, but, but the uh, lead was wrong. And so he had to write a 1,400-word correction, which is not something you want to do in your career. And, it, and it's really set things back. So, but what I want to illustrate here is that we're always looking for that thing, that front page thought. And on a slow news day in the summer, uh, that was the front page thought, open water at the North Pole, ouch. And so essentially, this is a headline that you will not see in the New York Times. Um, you know, this, is, this issue, there's been a lot of sense that a lot of things are happening right now. Uh, if you talk, if you really sit down Jim Hansen or sit down any one of these scientists in the room, they will say it's complicated and it's a statistical thing and we're loading the dice. and. Uh, but we're all still kind of, you know, thinking, well, we're, you know, th it, it isn't news. It isn't this. this all these things will, could play out over the course of a century, uh, but it's not going to look that way. It's not going to look like news to, to the executive editor of a newspaper who grew up weaned on politics and on things that look, that, you know, news is the thing that happened today that's clear cut. It's just not going to play out that way. And then I'm just going to quickly go back over the, 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 the balance thing. You know, it, this should be enshrined as a law of physics or something <laughs> because we are all so stuck on this idea and, and it really has become a destructive problem. And, and you know, there's been this sense that it's, well, it's not a problem anymore. Now I think a lot of journalists have kind of gone the other extreme. There are issues out there, especially when you get into the nuance of a specific question like hurricanes or, or a specific question like patterns of disease. There you do have a lot of PhD versus PhD and it's totally legitimate. It's not concocted, it's not paid for. They're, they're really, uh, you can tell the maturity of a scientific idea by the kind of discourse that's happening around it. And um, when you have legitimate people who are publishing papers on a monthly basis that take an issue this way, then that says you have a young science. And that's where the hurricane thing is right now. In fact, there's a paper coming this Thursday in the Journal of Science uh, by Chris Lancy that says the evidence for energizing storms is very weak and blah, blah, blah. 
And, uh, oh, that might be under embargo. Uh-oh, I think they're gonna, <laughs> well, that's all I'll say. And then, and then I was just told there's a paper coming on the, ener you know, the uh, heating of the oceans and how it's consistent with, with the, uh, the idea that storm energetics is, um, is happening because of the human influence on heat in the oceans. So we have to see where that plays out. The thing that we lose in all of that, in all that PhD versus PhD, is the middle of the bell curve. It, it, my, and, and looking at this for a long time, I started drawing this just simple bell curve. And here, you, here you've got a scientific idea, whether it's, um, um, well, we'll stick with global warming, <laughs> whether it's the human influence on climate or whatever. You have this really big mass of agreement in the middle. Everyone, even Richard Lindzen in that, eight content, that controversial April uh, Wall Street Journal editorial said, carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, more of it will make the world warmer. He said that, it, it's right there in the journal. Everyone's focused on all the other things he said, but he said that. So, so there's this great mass of agreement in the middle, but the thing we always, we the media and we the public and we the political realm focus on is those loudest little snippy voices at the edges of that, which are, it's a catastrophe, or it's nonsense. And that's what gets us into this trap societally. But it's not just journalism that's, that's at fault here. It's just how we frame issues generally. And uh, you're, you, I'm sure you've, you can go online and find the, uh, you know, the, the game plan that the, uh, the um, industry used to foment that, that sense of indecision and confusion. Um, just talk to Rick Piltz or Ross Gelbspan and my colleague Jack Cushman, who in 1998 first dis disclosed that. So that's on one side. You have a very concerted disinformation um, effort. And on the other side, you have this tendency, um, environmental groups, I think, have tended to focus on the, um, the hot stuff. Someone brought this up a little while ago, too. The stuff that plays on TV, the pictures, the drowning polar bears. Um, it's really, it, it, we love emotional content. You know, that's what makes a story a story, is the thing that makes the reader engage. But you can, you're playing with fire sometimes when you're playing with emotional content if you don't adequately consider what we actually know about an issue. And with polar bears, there are still some significant issues about, I mean, no one, no one denies that polar bears make their living on sea ice. So less sea ice means polar bears are gonna have a harder time. But many people lately have been making this case they're gonna go extinct in the next 30 years, as Tim Flannery said on his book tour up in Canada. And if you talk to any polar bear biologist who's actually worked with the animals, they, they, they won't support that. There's no one out there I've found who would say that that's the case. So you, you start to get into this, we're, we're very seduced by the idea that if you make the issue hot, suddenly people engage and that will solve the problem. And I wish it was that easy, but again, Groundhog Day. Um, so, and then you end up with this. Again, think of that bell curve and then think of these two images right here. Be worried, be very worried, or the subtitle here, how the environmental movement uses false science to scare us to death. Guess what, I'll bet you somewhere in the middle is, is, is a batch of knowledge. <laughs> Now, what do I do in the middle of all this? Well, I've, I've written, you know, again, um, just in the last six years, I've written about 250 stories on climate, uh, some sort or other, uh, some of them politics, some of them science, some of them economics. And I find, I find solace, among other things, <laughs> in places like the Arctic. This is when I, I went to Greenland um, a couple of years ago. And I didn't come naturally to the Arctic. Again, think back to my Jacques Cousteau days. I love I loved tropical stuff. I love warm water and, and uh, summer and rainforests. So it was, I had to be dragged by the weight of the news that was happening on the earth to the Arctic. But still, I've, I've gone three times in the last three years. Um, so it's, it's like that Al Pacino scene in the third Godfather movie. It's just pulled me in, you know, because that's where the news is now. It was the rainforest in 1988. And, and now there is a, there's a ton of change underway in the Arctic. And a lot of it is still confusing and a lot of it is not. Um, but the, the solace and the, 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 the value I get from going there is to talk to scientists when they're not in front of a microphone, unless it's mine, just alone <laughs> instead of in a room. And uh, we were flying here to the summit of uh, the ice sheet. Remember, we have basically twice the size of California, 13,000 vertical feet of ice. Uh, I calculated carefully for two days when I wrote the story. I kind of was working with atlases and oceanographers to figure out what's an, a similar volume of water. And it basically, it's like flash freezing the Gulf of Mexico. If you, if you flash froze the Gulf of Mexico, plunked it on land like a pancake, that's how much water is locked up there. So if you unfreeze it, obviously, you're adding a huge amount of water back to the oceans, 20 feet worth. And that won't happen tomorrow. It won't happen in the century. It will happen over centuries, actually a millennia or more, a millennium or more, according to most of the glaciologists I know. But 
but it's uh, definitely something to think about and to uh, c consider when you're uh, considering what to do about greenhouse gases. So we went, I went there with, um, here is um, Joe McConnell, who's um, a glaciologist at the Desert Research Institute in Nevada. <laughs> and it's not a boondoggle. Places that are dry, t a lot of places that are dry get their water from, glacial, from glaciers or snowpack. And so it's not unreasonable for Nevada to have a glaciologist. But here he was studying Greenland. And we're looking at ice that's tens of thousands of years old, squeezed out from the sides of that great ice sheet, crumbling away and melting. And it gets your attention too. And uh, one of the most remarkable uh, scientists I've spent time with, and again, he, he was remarkable because he was so transparent and open to me. Harry Bader from, he was working at the Department of Natural Resources in Alaska. Um, he came from the Yale School of Forestry, so he very much had an environmental you know, ethic. But here he is working for a place that under the Alaska State Constitution mandates their job at DNR in Alaska is to maximize the exploitation of the resources of the state of Alaska in the public interest. That's the only part of their mission that could possibly even be defined as, as environmental. But he was out there because climate change in, in Alaska on the North Slope has uh, reduced the frozen season when trucks and, and oil exploration convoys can drive over the tundra from 200 days a year to 100 days a year in the last 30 years. So, and it's a place where the oil companies actually really are starting to get agitated about climate change because it's impeding their ability to extract more oil to, for us to burn and turn into greenhouse gases to create more climate change. I don't think that's part of their thought process, but they were really worried that the, the uh, oil exploration season in Alaska is going away. So uh, they wanted to, the estate to expand the tundra travel season. And Harry was put in this bind of ha having, serving, you know, trying to find a middle ground. And he was honest. And you know, initially I was gonna write a gotcha story before I, I went there, I was gonna do this, by the way, it was energy department funding. So energy department funds Alaskan project to expand oil season in the face of global warming, you know, frozen season. It would have made a nice gotcha story, but, I, but he said, you know, Andy, come, you gotta come up, you gotta come up, you gotta come up. I'll, I'll show you everything, it's, it's really interesting. And it turned out it is more nuanced than that. Um, there probably is wiggle room in that tundra travel rule in Alaska. And uh, the reasons that the, oil, the frozen season has shrunk are large, a big chunk of them is sort of like that uh, hurricane data question is, um, it was, you know how they used to determine the tundra travel season? Piece of rebar and a sledgehammer. And if you can bang it 12 times and make it go down a foot or something like that, that meant it was safe for the trucks to roll. This was all done, it was very ad hoc. So again, it was not as simple as a gotcha story. It was more subtle and, and um, only by going with him in the field outside of the glare of, of uh, Washington and, and and uh, press conferences and stuff, could I really kind of get a sense of what, what to say to readers? And um, I gl I'm glad I held off. It was a good, solid story. And the thing that was also interesting about the story was it revealed, again, how science works. I mean, here's a guy, he's on his knees here, kneeling in a pool of light from his headlamp in December on the north slope of Alaska, 30 degrees below zero, 40 mile an hour wind, uh, blowing horizontal snow, horrific conditions, eight hours just tapping the tapping the frozen tundra and collecting data. You know, the most boring part of science is just collecting, the grunt work is this stuff, but it was great to, to watch and to convey um, his, him doing that. By the way, he has since quit his job up there and he's pretty fed up with what's happened in Alaska uh, in the government there. He, and then he went to Iraq to work for a, um, a nonprofit. Harry Bader is an interesting character. Uh, anyone know him? I bet someone does, no? Up, no? Oh, yes. <laughs> So, uh, and this is Harry Bader also leading a bulldozer through uh, that b ground blizzard that I was with him in. Um, again, just sort of a portrait of science, uh, the hard stuff, We're pretty far from the realm of policy. And this is what journalism looks like in the, on the North Slope of Alaska in December. I turned the camera around very briefly and just went click and that's, uh, that's uh, Sasquatch meets uh, Hannibal Lecter <laughs> <laughs> meets uh, me. It was a very interesting experience. And uh, I would take the North Pole any day over the North Slope in December. So finally, though, comes the North Pole. And I hope I'm on track here, time-wise. Um, you know, uh, they, there are some unanswered questions about Arctic change. Uh, the, the Arctic oceanographers and climate scientists you talk to say the reason uh, you have had a lot of warming up there is because the Arctic is a place that's like an amplifier for change. If you 
If you have a little global warming, the Arctic makes it into a lot of regional warming. But as they have emphasized, and Richard Alley and others among them are, are all, in, all, all in one voice on this, they amplify natural variability just as much as they amplify human pushed climate change. So you can't still, I mean, the sea ice people up there are still deeply divided over what's driven the recent pullback in sea ice. And it seems like a no-brainer to me, but the more I understand about the dynamics of that, it's like a big toilet, essentially, with, and the, the space between Greenland and Europe is where the, where the flush happens. And there was a big flush of thick, of multi-year sea ice in the 90s, and uh, some people say that that's, we're still seeing a residual effect from that. Others say, you know, this clear sense of buildup of heat in the ocean and it's melting back the ice. So even that, even that is not, it's not a uh, no-brainer, it's not a smoking gun, it's all evidence of change, and when you look at the climate changes around the world, the pattern, the balance of evidence, remember IPCC is all about the balance of evidence. The strength of the argument comes in that broader view of what's going on. It's like a pointillist painting. If you look at any one dot of pigment, it's got no meaning at all, but if you look at the whole painting, suddenly there's Sunday in the Park with George or whatever it is. That's, that's the thing to pay attention to scientifically, but that's the thing that makes journalists totally glaze over balance of evidence. You know, that, it's like a court summation. And that's why we're, we're, we're still very engaged by that, the hot little individual elements, but that's where it gets harder. So I'm not, well, anyway, so let's take, let's go, to, I wanted to go to the North Pole because it's the North Pole, because NSF was funding a project there to try to establish the first consistent database on ocean, ocean characteristics and ice characteristics in one spot in the Arctic Ocean. They'd been doing it for several years, and I kept saying, can I come, can I come? And they kept saying, well, not really, no. And finally, Alex Whitsey and I got to go. Is she here today? Maybe not. She's now at Nature, uh, Nature Mag uh, the journal Nature. She was at the Dallas Morning News when they still were covering science. And we, we got to go. We crammed into this airplane, 15-ton um, Hawker Sidley airplane with two, uh, two propellers, about a 40-year-old airplane. And we go flying north and flying north. Uh, this is familiar. This is just sort of everyone knows the sea ice has retreated and that polar bears are having a hard time. So we fly two hours north until there's no more north. When you start pointing south again, that means you're at the North Pole. And then we landed on the ice, and, which is a strange thing to do in a 15-ton airplane. At least it was strange to me to land on sea ice on a 14,000-foot deep ocean. We're talking about 10 Empire State Buildings. You know, this is underneath you. And the ice is about six feet thick uh, on that runway. And the Russians have carved a runway there for us, so, which is very nice of them. They have, and they, we first retreated to their camp initially, and that's where all the weird stuff started to happen. <laughs> Front page news, Santa Claus exists. <laughs> I would probably be very embarrassed if... Uh, so we got to this camp, and, and again, it was a totally strange thing. Uh, the North Pole was here. The title refers to more than just climate change. It refers to the fact that the sea ice is, is moving about 400 yards an hour. So if you're at the North Pole now, you're not there 15 seconds from now. And it also refers to the idea that the Arctic of our history, our lore, this untouchable place that killed everybody who tried to go there and it was beyond reach and beyond exploitation is being transformed in this century in many ways. One of the, which is that there are beauty queens at the North Pole. <laughs> in this case, it was a Russian woman, Natalia Lieberman. She was the runner up in the Mother Russia contest in 2003. Uh, the winner had, a par the prize for the winner included a trip to the North Pole. The winner said, mm, yet. <laughs> And Natalia said, sure. <laughs> and, she, and then she was actually in the same tent I was in. Uh, I didn't know she was a beauty pageant winner. <laughs> she was with a group of Russian uh, skydivers, actually, who had come to the North Pole to skydive at the North Pole. There had been a marathon run at the North Pole for the first time in history just uh, the week before we got there. So when I say the North Pole was here, you get the idea. It's not just what Senator Inhofe thought it was. Um, so here we are. This is a scientist. And... and, and there, there was one polar bear, actually. <laughs> now, all of that's weird enough, but the thing that really gets to you at the North Pole is, is the dynamics. Um, we were reminded that you kind of forget your, your I mean, it's, to me, we landed there, it's initially, it's kind of like being on the tundra of the North Slope. It's just endless ice in every direction. And then uh, weird stuff starts to happen. This was a, a crack, a, a polynia or a lead, whatever you want to call it that had uh, opened up a few and then closed again. The, the ice froze over, and that was a very sturdy plywood bridge that the Russians put across it so that we could have no fear of breaking through and falling into the 14,000-foot deep water. Um, and then this was the same spot a few hours later. So again, that water right there is 14,000 feet deep. And our helicopters are over there, and our tents are over here. <laughs> so, luckily, helicopters can fly, so it wasn't... 
a total disaster. But it just gets across to you the idea that this is a transitory landscape and a very hard place to do science. Uh, now, uh, just to prove you, to you how dy dynamic it is, it's not silent either. The North Pole is generally silent, but once in a while it's not. You can feel this, the, the uh, chunk that we're on actually starting to fail a bit more. Probably hairline cracks up the, um, towards okay. the helos there. So does that mean we should back up? Yeah, not yet. <laughs> you can always jump over a crack. <laughs> You can always jump over a crack. Remember that when you go to the North Pole. <laughs> this is uh, Tim Stanton, an oceanographer from the Naval Postgraduate School. And uh, he's been going up there for years. So he's got this cavalier kind of, you know, this is how you do it thing. And I'm thinking, this is insane. And they're, here's, so they're coming to this spot at the top of the world on a floating ocean, you know, on, on ice on a floating, floating on an ocean, unlike the South Pole, where you have, um, you know, a continent and you have doctors and mechanics and all that stuff. Here, this was science literally on the edge. Everything they, would do, they did, every tool they used just about had to be invented for the, for the procedure they were trying to do, which was, sounds simple on paper just to collect data in the same spot year after year, just like you would do by setting up an acid rain monitor in the Hudson Valley or something. But here, they're in a place where the ice is moving. The ice is never the same. You can't leave anything there. Cracks can destroy your equipment. I mean, the ridges. And, and uh, they were just trying to do it anyway for the sake of clarifying a little bit taking just one more of those little caveats down a notch about what's going on with Arctic change. And I think it's important with all that we've said about what we know, it's all, it is important to acknowledge that we are saddled with some uncertainty on this, on this issue of Arctic and, and global climate change. And there's, I think there's been this sort of mythology that someday it'll all be crystal clear. And some people say that th that day is now. And I think that's true for the basic concept, more carbon dioxide, warmer world, warmer world, Less ice, less ice, higher seas. There's, it's hard to find anyone who is informed on this issue who would disagree with those things. But if you get to the level of, you know, it's going it's to um, scorch wheat in, in Kansas or it's going to uh, take away the California snowpack, it gets more complicated because there are things we still don't understand. Some of them have to do with scale, resolution of models. Some of them have to do with processes we're still learning about, like how clouds form and dissipate. And, and I, I think it's important to tell readers and it, this is something else that journalists hate. We hate to talk about uncertainty. Scientists like to talk about uncertainty. Journalists hate uncertainty. It's that boring stuff that always gets cut out of your story, the caveats and the maybes. And, and, uh, but we have to make sure we have to fight to put some of that back in sometimes. And to say, this is what we know, and this is why we know it powerfully. We know it powerfully because a lot of people have been going around the world doing really weird, hard science and thinking about this for a long time. And these are the things that are settled. These are the things that are unclear. The things that are unclear are unlikely to be resolved in the time frame that's meaningful. And that means society has to figure this out with uncertainty. Uh, if you don't acknowledge that up front, then I don't think this, is, this debate is going to go in any partic particularly productive direction, no matter what your, your stance on the issue is. So a quick little last pay on to, to, the, the, to science on the edge. This is how they do it at the North Pole. You, you melt a hole through the ice. That's the same guy who was dancing with Santa Claus, Jim Osi. And you drop um, a chain of instruments that they had to basically invent, four, two miles long Kevlar line, studded with, with current meters, thermometers, salinity indicators, little hard drives recording data for a year. They drop that down, leave it for a year, come back a year later, pull it up, put down a new one, do it over and over again, and you start to have a portrait of change in the middle of the Arctic Ocean. If you don't do it, you don't know anything. And it was an amazing, audacious idea to even think they could do this. And then, of course, you have to get it back. You know, before you drop the next one, you have to pull up the old one. So it comes floating up under the ice in that 14,000-foot deep ocean. You're on top of the ice, so you've got to get that out of there. And that's where Jim Osi comes in, or goes down. Um, this, I, I did not follow them down uh, under the ice. My wife would not let me. <laughs> She's a science teacher, too, but there's, only, there's limits to, uh, to what she will allow me to do. Um, and this is a, a diver's eye view of the North Pole. Um, the lights are a little bright, but you get the idea. It's um, a very spooky thing to go under moving, shifting, cracking sea ice floating on a 10 Empire State Building tall ocean and try to do work. But that's what they were doing under there. And this year, normally it takes them about 10 minutes to go down, clip on the line, pull it out. And Jim, Jim Osi told me this year it was 42 minutes under the ice because he had, to, and he, actually, he had to get out his diver's knife. I had a piece in the paper earlier this year hidden deep in the science section on, on the latest update on this project.
And this, you know, my job is simple compared to all that. First, the first thing is just to get there. Journalists um, who st stay inside the Beltway are missing a lot of, um, what, of reality. <laughs> uh, I mean, there's a reality to what happens here, too, and it's extremely important, and I've been reporting on that part, too, and that's another one of those Al Pacino things. I would rather, I would rather not have to report to, to be kind of like a truth police, uh, but part of my beat has been that for the last um, number of years. So here, um, here I am in the garrison, I mean, the North Pole Bureau of the New York Times uh, in, my, on my, in my office with my desk and my assistant and my fact checker. Yeah, we, there, by the way, there are no fact checkers in newspapers. Uh, that's one myth to get. We, we, you are your fact checkers. You are your backstop. And I'm sa filing on a satellite phone at about um, 9,600 9, baud. Does anyone remember what that was like? <laughs> 45 minutes to send a low resolution picture from the North Pole. But, I, but we did it, and Alex, Alexandra did it too, and it was great, great fun. And this tent is the same tent, again, that had a bunch of Russian skydivers, uh, millionaire skydivers, and a beauty queen in it. Which... <laughs> and finally, it was time to go. After several days up there, three days, three nonstop daylight days, pretty wiped out. And if I look wiped out in that picture, it's because there are no showers at the North Pole. Um, there are other pictures I could show you about, um, like the latrine and the, the gulag-like aspects of being at the North Pole. But but I won't. So that leaves us in this place um, where there are, there are these huge questions that still linger out there. There are ways to tell the story of climate and, and its meaning to us, both on the global scale. You know, to me, I still think there's some heft to the basic conclusion, again, unassailable, that humans have essentially taken, gotten involved, have nudged a thermostat on a planet. I mean, that that is kind of a big deal. You know, in our if evolution as a species, we've always been a local influence. We, you know, pollute this lake, uh, chop down that forest and turn it into to, to houses, um, um, mine this coal, and now we are influencing a global scale system. And, and that's got heft to me, as well as the need for some relevance to current life. Uh, and I do think, as Jerry said, um, the reality still is that while the responsibility on figuring out some of these questions is, is ours because of the nature of these long-lived gases, the consequences, no matter how much we're looking as journalists or society for some current meaning, meaning something in the real world right now is my reason to act, we have to still acknowledge that this still is basically our children and grandchildren's issue that we're talking about here, and that uh, we're setting in a course that would be very, very difficult to, to divert. As David Hawkins said, at lunch or here, about it's more like the super tanker, you know, and and the reef is out there, and and I don't know. I'm you know here I am, 20 years almost after writing this story, writing the same stories, and I'm not sure that that speaks for the power of journalism to be the thing that changes this um, this equation, and that leads us back to the scientists in the room. So I'll stop there, and we can you know talk a lot more about all this stuff. You can read the first chapter of the book right there, and you can email me right there. I mean, I'm pretty easy to find. Everyone finds me, believe me. So thank you very much. We doing Q&A? We can take some questions. Yeah, I happily, happily take some questions and or sign books. And it's not a conflict of interest if anyone has been reading the Green Wire lately. Um, I would just like to point out that we cope with uncertainty in all kinds of arenas. We, had, we cope with uncertainty in health. We don't wait till we have a heart attack to decide that maybe we want to lower our cholesterol. Or <clears throat> The insurance industry says they don't need to know that something will happen. They just need to know that it could happen before they begin to react. So it seems to me that there must be ways that we can more creatively frame uncertainty, whether it's we are as a certain of, of this as we are of that, something common sense comparisons that would help readers put it into context. Yeah, well, uh, that new book by Ron Susskind about the, the Cheney, uh, the 1% doctrine, in that realm, the administration felt it sufficient. If you only had a 1% chance of something happening that was bad related to uh, weapons of mass destruction or whatever, you act on it. And Steve, but but and it's politically, and it's within their policy realm to, that that's important. Uh, now, how do you translate from the personal to the global societal? That's the challenge on an issue like this. And I'm not sure it's... Um, People have a very different calculus when you get farther from home on what to do or not do on the basis of those kinds of risks. But Stephen Snyder is saying that there, as I understand him, a 10 percent chance that we'll have a 20-foot sea level rise if, if Greenland melts. Probably someday, yeah. 
and actually Schneider, I quoted him in here, uh, 1988. Um, I just read it again. Yeah, he says, uh, we're altering the environment far faster than we can possibly predict the consequences. That is bound to lead to some su surprises. In other words, uncertainty is not a reason not to, not to exactly. act. Exactly. Depending on your point of view. Um, so that, sure, there's ways, there's metaphors, there's, there's all kinds of ways to, to tell that story. And I think scientists, I mean, Steve's been doing it for a long time, and there are others who, who, who do it on the other side too, <laughs> frankly. Uh, but but it's, it's something that people can work on, language. That's something that came out of that Yale meeting in Aspen last year too, language counts. Other questions? You, you in the back? Yeah, you. And uh, tell us who you are. Uh, Aries Keck and Earthbeat. And um, I was wondering what you thought of, of denial when it comes to people sort of hearing about global warming and then pushing it aside. There's the Swiss studies where they actually study what people thought about denial. And the more they found out about global warming, global warming the more they felt utterly hopeless. I don't know if that... It, we should probably talk about that when, the, when we're up on a, as a panel. They, you know, it, it's definitely an issue. They, in fact, when I've been talking to... Um, this is slightly relevant. When I've been talking to young people about this issue, which I've been doing more, more of because of the book, um, you know, a lot of them say, what can I do? And I say, well, besides screwing in a new light bulb, you can, you can change your career path so that you address some part of this. And I, and I stress, this is not just physics. It's social sciences, too, that need to happen here. One of the other conclusions from that Yale meeting in Aspen was... Social science has not really studied these questions of how we deal with different kinds of risk and what determines how we behave. And until we really know more about our own reflexes, our own nature, we're, we're not apt to be able to find ways to um, make a problem like this uh, something that triggers change. So that's, that's a, a huge part of the problem or issue, whatever you want to call it. I have a question about what you think you can do and other journalists can do to impact the coverage um, that your papers give to these issues. I'm struck by how much there is in terms of content on TV uh, about the natural world just in general, and yet there's so little column ink given to these issues, and it's really difficult as one in the environmental community to get your attention. What can we do, what are you doing to explain to your editors that people are interested, because I think the impact of the movie and the fact that there are all these TV channels out there covering the natural world hasn't really bled over into the media's coverage of the environment. And when we look for environmental reporters, we can't find them. <laughs> well, there's a bunch of reasons for that, one of which was what I s described what happened at the LA Times in the mid-'80s. You know, it's not, this is not a growth area. Science journalism, all the growth is in health coverage, news you can use, fitness, diet, psychology. Um, uh, I, again, the thing that could happen more that isn't happening enough is, is uh, engagement with editors and publishers of newspapers and, and other media outlets so that they understand that even though it doesn't fit the norms of 20th century journalism, by the way, everything we do, you know, I wear a tie because the, what was it, the 18th century that ties come from, or 16th century, it was, you know, it's a symbol of something. I won't get into that. <laughs> But we still wear ties because we're tied to old ideas. Um, and there are many who say that the 20th century norms of journalism, which are tied to the idea it's only stuff that happened today, have to change if we're going to address 21st century questions, which are, are like, you know, is peak oil real? Is climate change? How do you, how do you change policy on the basis of this kind of risk? Um, what do we do about Social Security? You know, there are all this kind of looming uh, issues with uncertainties. Um, somehow the media, and maybe this is an opportunity because the media are reinventing themselves and desperately trying to figure out how to survive anyway. Maybe they have, maybe it'll come, maybe that re represents an opportunity in terms of reorienting things more toward, among other things, reminding us that there is, a, there is an outside world. You know, we're sitting here in this air-conditioned room, but in a news room is a room, um, but the world out there is where a lot of stuff happens, especially in developing countries. And, and you know, so I think maybe there's an opportunity in, in, in what's happening right now, I suppose. But commerce still is driving the content. Um, so it's, whatever happens is still a big challenge on the, on the media front, too. Other questions? And say who you are again. Yeah, David Blackstein with National Council for Science and the Environment. I appreciate your uh, description of the tyrannies, and I want to just maybe draw you out as to how one addresses that. The uh, 2003 uh, 
Um, I attended a, a meeting with the leaders of EPA research and EPA information um, shortly before their State of the Environment report came out, and they invited some of us to talk about, you know, this report was coming out. How could we get, how could we help them to get some publicity? It and becomes a, just one of those, as one of my journalism professors used to say, a MIGO issue. My eyes glaze over. <laughs> it's like the blast shield comes down. <laughs> Um, well, don't we know that things are getting cleaner? You know, don't we know that the water is less polluted? Well, why do we need to cover? We, we rarely cover annual things on anything or cyclical, the anniversary of whatever. We just don't go there. So that would just be, you know, I would say pull the climate part and leak it to somebody. And then it'll be a page one story. <laughs> and maybe you'll get some coverage. There were some stories on the other elements in there. But it's just, um, unfortunately, that's just not, that's a tough one. I, I'm just speaking cynically and realistically. <laughs> Okay. Anything else? Did you have a good time? Oh, yeah. Um, Joe? I, I wonder if you could... I'll get the mic. Wait, wait for the mic. Joe Davis. Joe Davis, uh, Society of Environmental Journalists. wonder if you can share anything without getting into too much trouble about what is it like for you to pitch a story and what kind of hoops do you have to go through to get either a boring or non-boring science, uh, climate science story into the paper, much less on page one. And yeah. I realize there mi you might not be able to tell all, but some give sure. some sense of it well it's it's it involves saying the same thing over and over and over and over and over again if it doesn't involve just getting it in the science section in other words if i want to get a story on page 1 or have us get engaged in a bigger project years pass i'm saying years years pass i i'll i'll fill you in here's a breaking here's a, a big secret okay <laughs> not none of this is a secret but it, tsunami happens uh, I spent the, f the week after that tsunami writing with several colleagues a 6,000-word reconstruction of how that wave swept the Indian Ocean and, and what we learned about how science almost got it. You know, the scientists had just, just barely figured out that the Indian Ocean was vulnerable to huge tsunamis too, not just the Pacific. And it was an interesting tale about science, the information science can provide and how it does or doesn't get integrated and how we make decisions. And so we've just, we, you know, uh, an editor of the paper, uh, way up there, came by my desk the following Monday and said, um, what should we do, you know, what should we be doing more on this? And I said, well, inevitable disasters. What else do we know that's like this? Where science is, where science is revealing, uh, this is before Katrina, you know, and by the way, we wrote a nice story about the inevitable flooding of uh, New Orleans in 2002, um, after Scientific American, but anyway, we got that one right. But you know, this whole idea, of what is it that impedes, even when there is scientific un understanding ahead of time, our ability to use that knowledge, integrate it, and how do we make decisions and reduce risk? And uh, finally, now, not yet, because I'm working on another project, but later this year, I'll start in on a story. So now this is almost two years after we had that first conversation about inevitable disasters, avoidable losses. Now we're actually going to do it. Two years. So it's just basically persistence, because they're not news stories, and then, you know, Kaka happens in the meantime, and um, you have to deal with that. And I've been dealing with a lot of that on various fronts. So, but, but, but by the way, the, the, the miracle of the New York Times is we have the Science Times section where you can just get it in. That's why a lot of my stuff ends up ghettoized there. But I'm happy to get it in. <laughs> Tony. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, Andy, um, I think we might have had a conversation about this once before, but new seems to f emphasize new. And focusing always on new seems to be like focusing on a never-ending flood of unfinished sentences. It seems to me that the focus ought to be on relevance and importance. In other words, an issue doesn't have to be new to maintain relevance and importance. And so it seems to me that uh, uh, news outlets sometimes create it, their own roadblocks to sort of revisiting stories that are still relevant. You want to comment? Yeah, well, there's several. We don't revisit stories that someone else broke. <laughs> That's one thing. <laughs> we hate to tread in the, in the wake of another ship. And uh, 
So that and that happens, and that's unfortunate because sometimes the newspaper will or some other medium will break something that's important. Frankly, the who killed the electric car is a fascinating story. I'm not sure if that got told in the print media, the, the documentary that's out there. Um, and that would be an interesting story to redo, but I, I guarantee you no one will do it because the documentary has done it and no one wants to just be seen as sort of following the documentary. And on other fronts, we always are reinventing the wheel. That's what we do. <laughs> Every story, you know, it might be a tsunami, it might be 9-11, but there's the tick-tock, the reconstruct, the profile, the, you know, the, the how it happened, the, the who. The, the, we have little taglines for all these, these kinds of stories, the who, you know, who, what went wrong, who, who's to blame, blame story. You know, so we, we do. There's no problem with reinventing things. I, I think recognizing the thing that you want to re-explore is is the challenge. And again, they tend to be the things that the editors at the top are most familiar with. Yeah, because it gets to the difference between informing and a series of uh, disconnected thoughts. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe one more, or, or shall we uh, move to the panel? Is that a, yeah. Um, Microphone. And say who you are. I'm Betsy Scherzer. Um, I was just wondering what you felt the role of kind of celebrity journalists, people like Tom Friedman, people like yourself. Um, <laughs> or, <laughs> Does that mean I get a bank account like Tom um, Friedman? <laughs> and, and kind of their yeah. role in addressing climate change and making it just more wide known. Oh, this will, oh. This, I guess this is a being addressed in the panel. So why don't we just <laughs> stop? Is that right? Let me bring the panel up. That's okay. the question we're specifically going to address as part of the next panel. And Andy's on that panel. And don't forget the book. Go out and buy, go out and buy one. It's not a conflict of interest. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, as the panel comes up here, I, I want to uh, revisit a comment da David Berardo made. Uh, he reminded me of our, our, at times, heated discussion we had in these workshops on, um, he, he reminded me of the sometimes heated discussion we had in the workshops on whether journalists are educators. And the way I like to reconstruct that comment is to go back to Victor Cohn, who was one of the great science and health and environmental journalists, uh, the late Victor Cohn. Uh, Victor always used to say, "Scientists, uh, journalists are not uh, educators, but they do educate. So I think our discussion got to the point after some hemming and hawing where a lot of the reporters in our group agreed that science, the journalists do educate, but that they are not educators. They were comfortable with the verb, not with the noun. And that may be a subtlety, but it's one that a lot of the journalists arrived at. Uh, I'd also, as the group's gathering, I'd like to uh, point to a comment. I'm going to sound a little <coughs> bit defensive here in uh, reference to a couple of comments Andy made. Um, Andy's right about the ceiling and getting in uh, page one news directors and editors. Uh, that's been a real challenge. Uh, we did succeed with that at some points. Uh, we had, uh, who at the time was Andy's boss, uh, Corey Dean was the science editor of, of New York Times when she was uh, part of our workshop. That's still not quite high enough. Uh, we did at the University of Washington have the third generation owner and publisher of the Seattle Times, uh, Frank Blethen, a real renaissance person in the journalism community. So it was a delight to have Frank involved. And Frank has stayed very closely involved, although he's not here physically today. He's w well aware of what we're doing today. He's been very uh, actively involved. And the other one, um, this is a little bit of inside baseball, but uh, we arranged to have Len Downey, who was executive editor, or is executive editor of the Washington Post, he was to have joined us at Columbia University for our workshop there. And um, I like to tell this story. Um, the day before he was to join us, uh, the story on who was Deep Throat broke. And uh, Len Downey was an editor at the Washington Post during the time of the Watergate investigation. And here, 30 some years later, they finally were about to disclose who was Deep Throat. Of course, it wasn't the Washington Post story uh, that broke that, but uh, I think it was Vanity Fair. But in any event, um, I, Len Downey had to cancel at the last moment. And uh, I told him that um, I had waited 33 years to find out who Deep Throat was. I could have waited one more week, uh, <laughs> but uh, I didn't. So therefore, uh, Len wasn't able to join us. Um, 
believe it or not, Len Downey was to have been here today until a, a personal issue came up that pre prevented his being here today. But Andy's dead right. It's, it's real tough to crack through to that upper level. And that's one thing Tony and I are actually hoping to do with the next, uh, next uh, follow-up from this uh, in cooperation with groups like Pointer. Uh, so let me, um, there's so much to follow up on for this panel from the earlier discussions, from Andy's presentation, from uh, Mark Jerkowitz's comments. I have a couple specific things I'm going to follow up with after they ask some introductory comments, but let me uh, just ask them to, uh, if they would start, and I guess I'm going to go from the far end of the table, Jim Dutchin, and start in this direction. Uh, Jim, um, one thing you said today uh, in an earlier session you said maybe the news, news media have to create a climate science beat. Um, if anyone comes closest to having a climate science beat, it's, it's probably Andy, but he may be the only one in the country who has that beat. So I hope you could touch on that and other comments. Okay. <clears throat> all right, first I want to thank <clears throat> Bud and, and Tony for putting together all these workshops and what they've, what they've been doing. And I think it is moving forward, the whole issue of how scientists and journalists work together. Um, I do think we're also in a period of change, uh, both, we, and I'll talk a little bit about the economics of what's going on in the news media, but I think I, I, my sense is that there has been a shift in the way uh, the news media has been covering climate change. Um, later this week, we're, my center is involved in a workshop at Columbia University, and we're gonna be reporting some new findings about reporting about environmental issues on television, which shows that there has been an, uh, an, up an uptick in this since particularly Hurricane Katrina, and to some degree uh, with the coverage of, of climate change as well. Uh, so I think there's some real opportunities. Um, I think a lot of the, the best reporting about climate change is, is, is a little bit still beneath the radar. Uh, I've been a judge on a number of contests in the last year, journalism contests, since I'm a journalism professor, and, uh, and there are papers like the Rocky Mountain News did a terrific series of articles on climate change, looking at the impact on the skiing industry, looking at what was going on with wildlife, uh, a variety of other ways that things are being affected in the Rockies and in, and in, in Colorado. The High Country News, which is an alternative newspaper, uh, uh, a very good alternative newspaper that does very good reporting, has done some excellent work. There are uh, public radio stations around the country that have done terrific work, uh, individual things, which may not be, uh, you know, again, a little bit beneath the radar. You wouldn't see them because uh, uh, they're not national media. Um, I think I would like to see, uh, I think there needs to be a lot more work by scientists to the scientific community to support good science journalism. And that is, journalists do get uh, uh, criticized just as environmental sciences get, scientists get criticized. And, uh, you know, Andy's been most recently, he's been criticized by uh, people on Senator Inhofe's uh, staff, as other journalists have been, Seth Borenstein and others. Um, I'd, I'd like to see people in the scientific community come around and support uh, good science journalism. And you can do that in a variety of ways. You can do it with uh, uh, letters to the editor, op-ed page articles. Um, one of the things that I pushed for for so long, before I was a journalism professor, I worked at the Philadelphia Inquirer uh, for, as a science and environmental writer. And my big campaign when I was there was to launch a science section. And we finally did get a science section and health section launched. Uh, the tragedy is, uh, science sections in newspapers have been dwindling uh, steadily in recent years. And uh, uh, at one point, there were something like 100 science sections in the, in the, in the country. Uh, gee, if, we, if there's 20 now, I'd be surprised, uh, probably less than 20. Um, and one of the things is, uh, you know, journalists, uh, news, newspapers and news organizations are businesses. And... Uh, and science sections have not gotten advertising support. There are a few exceptions, and Science Times is one of them that I think is financially uh, stable and supported with computer ads. But boy, why don't we get uh, major science-related corporations, you know, Microsofts and the pharmaceutical industries and, and uh, you know, Dell Computers, et cetera, why don't they support science sections? The value of science sections is you don't have to have that 
that news peg, you can do the more thoughtful, longer, in-depth piece. Um, so that's a real, a real challenge. Um, I also, and I know this has been brought up a number of times in, um, in these workshops, um, but one of the things that, uh, that I teach in my classes at Michigan State, and I know many other uh, science writing professors, environmental writing professors teach, is that the old classic political model of reporting doesn't work uh, really doesn't work for reporting complicated science stories, everything from stem cell research to uh, climate change to biotechnology, there's all sorts of things. It doesn't work. Uh, and by that I mean, and you know, there really is a, if you go back into the history of, of, of journalism in this country, um, you can go back to, uh, you know, before 1850s, before the Associated Press was started, you really had separate uh, news media that favored you know, one political part or the other. With the rise of the Associated Press came the whole concept of balanced reporting for economic reasons. They were selling these stories to different papers and they wanted to have one side versus the others. So we've had this long tradition of reporting. This is what the Democrats say, this is what the Republicans say. This is what developers say, this is what environmentalists say. This is what you know, climate skeptics say, this is what other people that believe it say, okay. It doesn't work on complicated stories like this. So you need a longer form uh, type of journalism. You need uh, a chance to, to explain the nuances, explain the complexities, the uncertainties, uh, where is the consensus of opinion on these issues, and explore these issues. And the challenge in this economic climate of news media is who's going to publish these? And we'll get, to, we'll get to that, I think, a little bit later. Um, what Bud alluded to is the, one of the things I talked about in, uh, earlier today was, you know, climate change is something that is affecting so many different beats now. And uh, you now have climate change is affecting, you know, it's crossover into religion and what the religious communities are doing, into tourism, into sports, what's the impact on the skiing industry? It's, it's going into business, agriculture, forestry, you name it. It's one of those issues that is, is having an impact. It's, it's gone from the theoretical to, you know, impacts that are, that are noticeable that journalists can write about. So I threw out the idea, you know, why not uh, establish climate change beats, uh, at least at some of, the, some of the bigger papers that look at these, um, these put, bring these all together. Um, you know, this has happened again uh, before. I mean, back in the 1970s, there was a whole rise of energy reporters with the energy crisis. There were a lot of energy reporters. A lot of these have faded. Uh, you had, you had the, the launch of labor reporters in the 50s and 60s. Many of them have faded. You had AIDS reporters in the 1990s. Many of them have faded from view. But the fact is, this is an important issue. You need some specialists that can bring all these portions together I'd like at least the news media to think about that concept. Uh, one of the other ideas that I, I threw out today, and this is more to be a provocative idea because it's certainly not fully thought through, uh, but I just threw it out and I thought it would be worthwhile having a little debate. And that is, all right, we have this, we have this uh, situation now with the rise of thousands of blogs, you know, all sorts of websites, all sorts of competing information. The public's confused what to believe, what to not to believe. More than ever, there's a demand for authoritative, knowledgeable journalists that people can trust and they can read. All right, so here's, here's the concept. American Meteorological Society has, since 1957, had a seal of approval for their weather forecasters. And something like 1,400 uh, weather forecasters on uh, on most on TV stations have got the seal of approval. Uh, and they proudly sort of announce that I'm a seal of approval meteorologist. Okay, I've got the seal of approval from the American Meteorological Society. More recently, in, 19, in 2005, they broadened it to be a certified broadcast meteorologist. And to get these certifications, you have to pass some tests. Uh, you know, I think Tony would know all the details. But the idea is, could you, um, create some sort of a certification, like a certified environmental science writer that you put in your card, you put in your resume, but it was something that would tell 
the public, at least you'd, you'd been uh, trained, you had some experience in this, some knowledge in this, uh, in this field. I'm not talking about licensing reporters. I'm not saying you cannot write about these issues if you do. It's just something else that you would, you might put on, and it might help the public differentiate. Um, and then I think the final thing, I do want to talk about the economic models, and that is um, earlier Mark Jerkowitz, work, Jerkowitz talked about, well, he, he mentioned John Carroll, the former uh, editor of the LA Times, saying that we need a different form of, of ownership in the news media. And uh, John Carroll was one of the editors of the Philadelphia Inquirer, where I used to work. And, uh, and I think there's an awful lot to that. And I think, it's, I think a long-term trend that journalists, those who are interested in serious journalism, have to think about, and, and people at the highest level need to think about this, that the corporate model of uh, public companies to, with shareholders demanding more and more profits each term, is that serving, uh, is that serving society well, especially on complicated stories? Um, there, are, there are some alternative models. Um, the best newspaper, I think many people would say, and the largest circulation newspaper in, in Florida now is the St. Petersburg Times. That is owned by the Pointer Institute. It's a, it's a publicly held nonprofit. Uh, they do ter terrific uh, reporting and very good journalism. The Aniston Star in Alabama has a similar arrangement. Uh, you have some, some interesting economic models out there that, that I think are worth exploring and seeing to counter the trends. And I'll, and I'll go back again, go back into history. Um, you can look at, there's been lots of experiments of economic models of news media. As recently as in the 1920s, when, when radio stations were coming to the fore for the first time, commercial radio stations, there was a big debate in this country should we have, should we sell ads on a commercial radio or should we endow radio stations, create endowments for radio stations like hospitals and universities? And maybe that's a better model. You'd be less beholden to advertising pressure. And ultimately the advertising model won out. So I think we're, the economic situation in the news media is there's a lot of interesting models that are out there, you know, Yahoo and Google and how are they selling their ads and what can we learn from this? I'd like to see a lot more create, creative thinking in this area. Attorney. Thanks very much. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here today. I enjoyed the uh, session uh, last year at Columbia, which was my first one, and I'm enjoying this one today, too. I thought that in addressing some of the questions that we were asked to ponder for this afternoon, I would begin by discussing some of the opportunities and obstacles and uh, one impression that I have, at least, and I think it's shared by some of the other people we've heard from today, is that for the moment, at least, there's been a period of transition in the media coverage of climate change, and that we're seeing a little bit less of the dueling experts style of coverage and a little bit more in the way of stories that just accept the reality of climate change as a given. This transition poses both opportunities and challenges for scientists and journalists. Uh, for scientists, one challenge may be to let journalists know when the coverage is getting ahead of the science. And I think when Andy in his remarks referred to the situation with hurricanes right now, that's an example where it is possible for the, for the coverage to get ahead of the science. There are still very large uncertainties about how rapidly uh, tropical cyclones are responding to climate change. And so extrapolating recent trends and even whether or not we're certain about those trends is something where it may be necessary for scientists to hit the brakes a little bit and say, not so fast. That may not be a very natural thing for all of us to do since many of us have spent a lot of time over the last 10 or 20 years trying to refute the arguments from the contrarians about whether or not climate change is real. So it's a bit of a role reversal to now be saying, but wait a minute, not so fast here. For journalists, I think the challenge is going to be to resist the pressure to get back into this dueling experts style of coverage and to reintroduce artificial balance into their stories. And I think Jim's comments about balance are very relevant here. And my feeling is that with a number of the things that have happened recently, including uh, 
coverage of climate change that's not as much dueling experts and also the publicity surrounding an inconvenient truth, uh, there will be a stepping up of efforts uh, to raise doubts about the reality of climate change. And we can't afford to be caught in that Groundhog Day moment that uh, Andy was telling us about, where we're still reading the same stories 20 years from now that, we're, that we were reading 20 years ago. A couple of other comments that uh, occurred to me during this morning's session. Um, at one point, I was uh, thinking about the movie, uh, not one that received very good reviews, as far as I recall, but uh, the trailers were pretty funny at times. The movie Click with uh, Adam Sandler, you know, he has this, he's given this device where he can pause and fast forward time. And so if we had a device like that today and you didn't use it to fast forward through my remarks, and instead we just fast forwarded to 2056, which is 50 years from today, that's a nice round number. Um, and we walked outside to try to see what our climate and our environment was like. Even though there's a range of possibilities, uh, we're still not sure what path emissions will take. Our climate models don't necessarily agree on exactly how rapid climate change will take place, although they do agree on the basics. What we would find are probably more heat waves. It's July in Washington. That's not a very pleasant prospect. But imagine, per, for example, a very real possibility that the average day is more like the top 10 percent of the worst days that you can have in Washington. Sea level will probably be a little bit higher, and with it, increasing inundation of coastal areas and vulnerability to storm surges from, storm, from uh, hurricanes or other winter storms. And if uh, the evidence is right, both from models and observations, there may be changes in the frequencies of floods and droughts. All of these things are things that potentially will impact society. And in a democratic society, it's important for knowledge to be available to the public and to policymakers to inform their decisions about what direction we're going to take in terms of either trying to slow down the rate of climate change or to respond and adapt to climate change. And in my view, the, it's extremely likely that we're going to have to deal with both issues. So that had me posing the question, how can scientists and journalists work towards this goal of having uh, our public and our policymakers well informed enough that 50 years from now, none of them are saying, well, why didn't I know about this? Why didn't we see this coming? And so um, I have three things that I've been thinking about um, in the last couple of hours. Uh, they're not necessarily well formed, but I'm going to throw them out for the sake of discussion. And for symmetry, I have two recommendation, uh, one recommendation each for journalists and scientists, and then one that I think applies equally to both of us. For journalists, is there something to be said for developing relationships with specific individual scientists that you, through your experience, feel are neutral brokers of information? They're not talking to you about the science of climate change and its implications because they are advocates of a specific policy agenda, but rather because they're trying to get the best information out there. And it's, this is a very fine line, and obviously there was some suggestion made during the discussion this morning that maybe scientists should even do more to uh, move from just reporting on science to advocating certain policies. But I think uh, there is a value in scientists who can serve as neutral brokers of information, and the journalists with the skills that they develop through their training and through their experience should be especially good at recognizing when they found someone who's a good neutral broker of information. For scientists, I think there's also a challenge. And the challenge is to ask oneself the question, what is the product of your efforts as a scientist? For many of us, we would say that our lasting impact comes from the papers that we write. 
But as has been discussed, there are scientific papers that are written in something that might very well be another language for maybe many of you in this room today and certainly for the general public even more so. So is a paper the only real product of our efforts or does it also include things like uh, giving students a broad understanding of not only the science but the way that science is integrated into questions of public policy? Does it also include lectures to community groups to try to better inform not just our students but also the public in general about important issues? And yes, also an explicit uh, role that we may have is to be willing subjects of interviews with journalists to recognize that journalists have deadlines and space limitations and that their job isn't to write a press release about what we've done, but instead to try to synthesize the information they learn from individual scientists. And then finally, I think something that both journalists and scientists can do is try to respect one another's roles. Our roles are very different. As has already been discussed, Maybe as scientists, we have an, expe an expectation that journalists can serve as our surrogates in helping to educate the public. But while that often happens as a result of journalism, it may not be their primary responsibility. Similarly, the primary responsibility of a scientist is not necessarily to give an unqualified answer to whatever the pressing question of the day may be. And so mutual respect for the differences in one another's roles, I think, will go a long way in fostering communications. And finally, I just want to uh, tell a short anecdote about a talk I gave to a, a, a community group. Uh, this was about a month or two ago. Uh, in the part of New Jersey that I live in, there happen to be some very large retirement communities. And I got a request to speak to a, a chapter of the League of Women Voters from one of these retirement communities. And this was in the middle of the day on a weekday. And un not unexpectedly, the audience was filled with people who were retired. And at that stage in life where they, they certainly didn't mince words about what was on their mind. <laughs> and when my talk was over, one of the uh, people in the back of the room uh, who'd been listening to my talk came uh, and asked some questions afterwards came up to me and said, you know, Dr. Broccoli, I enjoyed your talk, but you're really way too pessimistic about climate change. And she went on to explain why she felt that way. And it was clear that what she was referring to pessimism is what I might just describe as the fact that there are some daunting challenges associated with this problem, many of which have been discussed already, the timescales over which it evolves, and also the uh, very integral nature of fossil fuel combustion in our uh, economy and our daily lives. So I think in communicating about this subject in the future, it's going to be something that I take to heart that while I need to make the point that this is challenging, it's not necessarily pessimism. There are things that we can do, and a good place to start is trying to foster a better understanding of what the issues are. Thanks. Attorney. Ben. My name is Ben Santer. I'm uh, an atmospheric scientist at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, and I've spent the last 20 years of my scientific career studying the nature and causes of climate change. I'd like to make a few brief points. Uh, the first one is climate change is real. Uh, someone this, this morning asked the question, well, what is truth? What do we really know? We know beyond a shadow of a doubt that human activities have changed the chemical composition of the atmosphere. That's a mutable fact. That's not speculation. That's not theory. We also know that those changes in the chemistry of the atmosphere uh, will have important consequences in terms of the amount of heat that they trap in the atmosphere. So we know and we agree on the fact that we've changed the chemistry. The world is going to warm. Uh, we don't know exactly how much it is going to warm by. <clears throat> so human-induced climate change is real. Andy mentioned this issue of trajectory, uh, and I just wanted to very briefly read you the bottom-line conclusions of the last three assessments of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. In 1990, um, the first assessment concluded that 
unequivocal detection of the enhanced greenhouse effect from observations is not likely for a decade or more. But barely six years later, in 1996, uh, the second assessment came up with the infamous balance of evidence statement. The balance of evidence suggests a discernible human influence on global climate. <clears throat> a sentence that uh, caused me a lot of grief in my subsequent professional career. Uh, despite the fact that it was a very cautious statement, not Eureka, we understand everything, let's all go home, uh, but the balance of evidence. When we ev evaluate the totality of the evidence, this is the conclusion that we reach. In 2001, in the third assessment report, as a number of people have mentioned, uh, there was an attempt to actually quantify the size of the human effect on climate, a much stronger statement than the cautious balance of evidence statement. The statement was, there is new and stronger evidence that most of the warming observed over the last 50 years is attributable to human activities. So there's trajectory, Andy. Absolutely. <laughs> and I think that uh, in the fourth assessment report, which is due to be published in early 2007, that trajectory will continue. The last five years since the third assessment report have seen uh, compelling evidence, I think, of human effects on climate. The atmosphere has continued to warm. The Earth's surface and the oceans have warmed. Sea level has continued to rise. We have the first measurements of the mass balance of things we really care about, like the Greenland ice sheet, and uh, compelling evidence that that mass balance is negative, that the Greenland ice sheets and parts of Antarctic ice sheets are losing mass. Uh, we have uh, continued evidence of cooling of the stratosphere, uh, evidence of many changes in uh, hydrological variables. So the climate system is telling us an internally consistent story. It's internally and it's physically consistent. And I think that has really made a difference over the last uh, four or five years or so to reporting on climate change related issues. So I really get bugged when you uh, hear these uh, statements coming uh, sometimes from the administration that we know nothing or very little about the nature and causes of climate change. That sounds to me like uh, Sergeant Schultz on uh, Hogan's Heroes saying, we know nothing, we know nothing. <laughs> that's, that's a myth. We know a lot about cause and effect relationships in the climate system. So that's one message I want to leave you with. Another message is I do think that uh, there's been a discernible change in the reporting on climate change. I think, uh, as a number of other people have already said, that we're moving from the is it real stage of reporting to well, what should we do about it? And really that is a remarkable transition. <laughs> and I think uh, in part it's occurred because of what Bruce uh, Lieberman referred to as these teachable moments. Things like the European summer heat wave in 2003, uh, things like uh, Katrina, uh, things like uh, possibly this summer's heat wave that uh, is fairly coherent, not just confined to a few areas of the United States. <clears throat> So uh, I, I do think that there's some signal there in the reporting emerging from the noise, and, and that's encouraging to me. Third point, communicating in plain English. <clears throat> it's really tough to communicate to uh, lay audiences why we should care, why you should care about the behavior of an odorless, colorless gas, CO2. Why, why should we worry about this? What's the two-minute speech you would give to your neighbor standing over the fence, the message you would give them? Why should you care about this? And for me, it has a lot to do about children and grandchildren, uh, about the future. I think anyone who has kids has to be justifiably a little concerned about the climate future we're leaving behind for them. The decisions that we take today and over the next couple of years on what to do or not to do about climate change, that's our legacy. <coughs> that's what we are leaving behind for them. And it's very clear, despite all the uncertainties in the science, that that legacy will not be the status quo. It won't be today's climate. It will be a very different, potentially very different climate from the climate of today. <clears throat> Although we can't make uh, judgments, as has been said already, about the attribution of individual events, individual heat waves, storms, floods, Katrina, to human activities, we can 
make attribution statements about changes in risks of those extreme events, and indeed people are already making them. There was a very nice paper published in 2004 uh, which looked at the European summer heat wave and made an assessment of how human activities had changed the risk of that event. So this is in common practice in the medical community, the, the concept of fractional attributable risk. You have some control population, you have some population you give a treatment to, you evaluate how the treatment has changed the probability or risk of some bad outcome. We have no doubt that the probability of things that uh, are potentially very bad outcomes, uh, that those probabilities are being changed by this gradual change in the mean state. Before Andy speaks, um, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, I was just having a, just, just, just a few more remarks, bud. <clears throat> so I, I think these are the kind of things that we need to communicate in plain English to people. And my recurring nightmare is that uh, <clears throat> if I survive to 2056, which is very unlikely, <clears throat> that my son would uh, say to me, hey, hey, Dad, you were a scientist. You knew that all of this was likely to happen. Why didn't you folks do more about this? That would be a terrible outcome for me personally. <clears throat> Finally, if I can get to the next page here. <clears throat> So what should a scientist do in this uh, arena that's fraught with peril? I, I think we have to speak up, even though speaking up is sometimes like that whack-a-mole game. You know, you stick your head uh, out from the mole hole and somebody is waiting there with a very big hammer, but you can't be a mole. You can't stay in the hole. <laughs> there are times when we really do, I think, have a moral and ethical responsibility to tell people this is what we know, this is what we don't know. Uh, that's important. <clears throat> I do think uh, that we need to show people, and this has come out in, in a couple of these previous meetings, what has been called the passion of the scientist. That, uh, you know, publics have a perception of scientists as geeks who do these weird things, and they, they really aren't normal like the rest of us human beings. They're a breed apart. Uh, and y you look at TV shows, there are very few shows that actually deal with scientists and what it's like to discover things, to learn stuff about the way the world works, and conveying to people why you really care about what you do, why it matters to them, <laughs> what's interesting uh, about it, uh, why you're impelled by, by curiosity. Those are things that maybe we don't do as well as we should have done and uh, are, are really key to this issue of conveying climate change to the public. <clears throat> and very finally, I, I, I'd like to mention what I call the false dichotomy. So often in reporting, and this again bugs me, you'll hear uh, discussions on the what to do about it cast in terms of regulate emissions of greenhouse gases or preserve millions of American jobs, as if these things were mutually exclusive. That is a false dichotomy. I believe that this uh, problem, uh, serious as it is, offers tremendous economic opportunities. In a, world, in a world of 2056, where oil is a scarcer resource, people are gonna have to find energy from somewhere. <clears throat> and we need to be thinking now about how to supply energy, low carbon energy, in, uh, in a very different world. And just casting the problem in terms of a, you know, either or, either reduce greenhouse gases or, uh, you know, you, you, uh, <clears throat> you, if you do that, you have these, these tremendously bad outcomes in terms of the economy. I think that's just rubbish. And the encouraging thing to me is that it does seem like that argument is being recognized by the business community too. <laughs> there are enlightened companies out there like BP and Shell, that are spending millions of dollars in investing in alternative energy. And I think that is an important part of this debate too, the recognition on the part of the, uh, the business community that the times they are are changing and you, you better change with them. Thank you. Um, before Andy speaks, I'd like to take him back to the last question that came up before this uh, panel was seated. Um, I'll do so by quoting a, uh, the first sentence of an article that Andy uh, wrote in the Times on April 23rd, 
the sentence was this, uh, global warming has the feel of breaking news these days. I followed that up with the observation that on Sunday in the, New in the Washington Post, the columnist started his story by saying, global warming is having its moment in the sun. <laughs> and now I'll go to the question that was directed by you, uh, the role of celebrity journalists, and maybe Andy can fit this into his answer. Um, in an overhead I was going to project, but you're asking the question, say, is my having to do it? Uh, I would have listed uh, Maureen Dowd, uh, Tom Friedman, uh, Tom Brokaw, and very interestingly, David Brooks, uh, as among the celebrity journals. We now know that we can add Andy Revkin to that, uh, that uh, category, which I'm not sure he'll put on his resume. No, I'm a celebrity uh, songwriter. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but my question that I hope Andy can uh, help us uh, understand is uh, journalists are famous for bandwagons. There, clear, there appears to be a journalism bandwagon on climate change. And my question is, is the bandwagon and the role of celebrity journalists a good thing? Hmm. Well, um, as I've been learning about energy research and development, the thing that is vital that doesn't happen, and I've been looking a lot at this lately for a story I'm doing, uh, is sustained effort. Um, it, yeah, there's bubbles and trends and coming and going. And if we have another big volcano or um, whatever, you know, this could go away quickly if some other issue comes up that's more pressing. Um, so sustained effort. And that gets back, I guess, to what Jim was talking about with this idea of climate beat. Although I'm not sure, uh, I'm not sure I would pigeonhole it that tight. I mean, the, the key thing I, I think would be good is if we got out of a lot of our silos and looked at, re, and this relates to 21st century journalism as opposed to 20th century journal, journalism, if we look at risk um, as a beat, meaning um, then you could have a Washington-based, I keep talking about this at the Times, we, we have a Washington-based reporter who covers FDA, but he, thou shalt not cross into EPA, thou shalt not cross into other agencies when there's all, USDA, there's all kinds of overlap between those, those realms, but he covers FDA. And why is that? I mean, we have a guy who covers NASA, but he won't write about other technology issues in Washington because that's not his job. And, and we have to uninvent the way we look at problems because these are, these are multi, everything we're facing in this century is a multidisciplinary problem. You can't look at the defense issue as just about tanks and building better armor. It's, actually, they're looking at fuel efficiency, the Pentagon. They're the ones who are really focused on, they're building the world's largest solar community in Hawaii. It's the Pentagon that's doing it. So, so sure, but our defense re reporters are not writing about that. So if there was someone who was focused on, uh, you know, just more widely on, on issues of risk, I think it would be beneficial. Now, I just want to tick off a few things. Um, and as far as columnists and stuff, I mean, um, uh, you know, sure, they have a bully pulpit, and uh, uh, we've had a couple of people who've gotten focused on this issue off and on uh, at the Times. Uh, Nick Kristoff uh, and um, Bob Herbert even was writing about global warming for a year or so. So now, uh, so getting back to a couple of quick things, uh, I'll be like rapporteur here. And, uh, well, you know, we should have a, a new TV show. CSI is so so popular, right? So why can't it be CSI, climate science investigator? <laughs> <laughs> CSI. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that wouldn't work. <laughs> like, I mean, look at all these cool guys. We're surrounded by all these cool men and women who do this stuff. Can't they? You know, they have to run out the door. You just have to run more. <laughs> no, maybe that won't work. <laughs> uh, never mind. So scratch that one off. <laughs> I, and I also I do agree with Ben on the need to examine. The journalists have given uh, economics side of this uh, a total pass. I have been trying for, for several years on my, uh, to examine the economic projections of costs of mitigating greenhouse gases as, as critically as I examine the uh, consequences of climate heating. Um, and, and I haven't been able to do it adequately. And it comes in bits and pieces. And every time, I did a story in 2000, just before the election, on how the White House um, in 2001 pulled out of the campaign pledge to regulate carbon dioxide based on an energy department analysis that the EPA said was, was totally flawed and shouldn't be used. And, and someone gave me the documents in which the EPA said to the White House, this, this analysis doesn't really tell you anything valuable about the cost of doing this with power plants, and they ignored it. Um, but if you don't understand economics and economic modeling and stuff, then you can't get that side of the story. And frankly, I'm still learning, and our economics reporters write about economics. They don't, they haven't, you know, it's like, Slowly, I think that that might be changing, but 
But the economic side is a huge untold story. And, and the more, and right now in writing about energy, <laughs> energy forecasting, if you think, if you, if you think there's any validity to the skeptics' attacks on climate models, just look at how energy forecasts for the last 20, 30 years have played out by all those high-priced energy analysts out there. Every one of them is worse than random. I mean, far worse than random, <laughs> literally. And they get paid big bucks to, to make energy forecasts. For, and you just look at, there was a couple papers recently on this that are just mind-boggling. So economics, 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 and more economics. Um, and I think the science community uh, they've done it on occasion. Um, the uh, British had that, that, that meeting last year on da avoiding dangerous climate change. Um, the framework convention is built on the phrase, uh, on, the, on the, um, the goal of avoiding dangerous climate change. But scientists uh, rarely, honestly, have spoken out and say, said, that's not our, we can't answer that for you. There's some, some mythology out there that science is going to tell you how much is too much, how much sea level rise is too much. Jim Hansen has a very strongly articulated feeling about how much sea level rises too much, but that's his value judgment. And if you live in Montana, it's not going to be very meaningful to you. Um, but I think there, there's, a, there's this ongoing tennis match between science and the society on the danger, the dangerous question. I've written something like five stories in the last five years on how much is too much. And, and it always comes back to, guess what? That's our question to answer, not science's question to answer. And, and I don't think there's been enough articulation of that. I would like to see the National Academies come out with a letter that says, we can't answer that for you. Uh, I don't think, and I think there's a role for the National Academies that hasn't, they're still, they, I mean, they had that letter from the 11 Academies last year, which was um, interesting. And, you know, you could say it was political because it came out right before the G8 meeting and, or whatever. But they, they've had a, still overall a passive role. The, you know, the, the president asked them in 2001 for that assess, big, quick assessment, but they haven't. The academy has the right, apparently, I think, under its charter to actually initiate its own work. Um, but they tend to, yeah, money, money. But money is out there, <laughs> Bill Gates or, I don't know, someone. Uh, why don't, why is it, can't there come a time when the National Academy says on some particular question, we'd like to explore this a little bit? And, um, and find the money for it. That, that puzzles me. So that's, I'll leave it at that because I don't want to cut in too much into question time. Let's open it to questions from you all. And I hope uh, at some point we'll address the role of editors. It was also brought up earlier. Yes. Chuck Bernstein, National Environmental Trust. Uh, this gets back to something Naomi was talking about uh, this morning. I'm curious about. Sometimes it seems like a pass is being given, not just to some of the professional skeptics, but to even some people in the media or uh, in the political realm. Uh, for instance, um, in 1996, um, the House Science Committee was investigating Ben, <laughs> and the uh, chief, uh, Dana Rohrbacher, was behind that. And the chief of staff was uh, our current climate negotiator, Harlan Watson. <laughs> something that doesn't come out very often. Uh, and now we've got Tony Snow, who's at the White House. And there was a lot of comment when he was appointed that, oh, it's so amazing he's a journalist and he's here as press secretary. Uh, Tony Snow is on record as having uh, equated environmentalists with child molesters. He called Al Gore's uh, Earth and Balance equivalent to the Unabomber Manifesto. And uh, let's see, back in 2003, he said, global warming phobia has become officially theological. Uh, and yet there was absolutely nothing about this reported. I mean, I don't know if it's just not interesting or somebody's being given a pass or what. I could say something quick on that. Uh, some of that has to do with the, the White House delegation of journalists. Um, I, I only got to pass through that bubble once when Bush gave his 2002 speech on climate at NOAA. I got to go inside the presidential bubble for a couple hours. And I saw them, they, they're, they're like one organism, the, the White House press crew. They kind of come in in a mass. They have their cameras, bristly sort of octopus thing with a lot of cameras. And they come in, they're, they're shepherded, they're in the same, they're in the same motorcade. Uh, they come in, the president says something, they write it down, and then he leaves, and they have to leave. They literally have to leave because they go in the same motorcade, same plane, et cetera. And they're, they're very, uh, there's, a, there's a relationship there that is not, particularly journalistic. And I think that you, you, when you put a Tony Snow in the middle of that, they're very un, un, not unapt to write bad things about Tony Snow. I'm not, I haven't been one of them, so I, 
I'm just making a judgment. Having see what happened that day, I went through there. I was in the bubble for an hour. The president gave his speech, 20 minutes. And they all shuttled out the front door, and I went out the back door, and there were all these Greenpeace protest protesters. There was a hundred, several hundred people on the street yelling about global warming. That wasn't in any of their stories <laughs> because they were in the bubble, and they just stay in the bubble, and they take down whatever he says and kind of go on. And, and I think that there's some... That's one of the problems with American media right now. Well, media generally. Oh, there's the tradition of whatever. Yeah, it's like senators don't snipe at each other, I suppose, too. Um. Yes, in, in the back there. Thank you. I'm, I'm Jack Smith. I'm with the Chesapeake and Potomac Regional Alliance. We're a regional planning group. I read a recent paper uh, in science led by uh, an MIT scientist and two or three other universities uh, using a British model, uh, weather prediction model. And their finding was that the agricultural product, the dollar value of the agricultural product of California by the year 2050 would be one half of what it is today, and the agricultural product of Pennsylvania would be double what it is today. So my perspective on climate change is that you have global warming, and then each watershed, mountain zone, uh, ocean zone, will have a different effect from climate change. So if I look at the Nile and I look at the Rhine, or I'll get a very different result of global warming. If I look at Mexico and I look at Argentina, that the impact is going to be very different. Good, bad is another thing. But there are going to be huge differences to one climate zone to another. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I, as, I, as I understand the question, yes, I, I would confirm that uh, climate change is going to have regional manifestations that differ from place to place. And uh, I think Bruce Lieberman brought that up in his uh, remarks this morning during this morning's panel, that uh, what we would really like to know is specifically what the impacts of climate change are going to be at every locality on Earth. But there are real scientific and technical challenges to doing that. So our focus tends to be on the things that we feel we understand more robustly. Uh, and uh, while I share some of Richard Somerville's reservations about the term global warming, one reason why that term has taken hold is because it is the most robust part of what we think we know about the climate. Uh, and how it will change. But there are certainly going to be other things that change. Uh, the hydrologic cycle, precipitation, evaporation, is going to change, and there are going to be winners and losers. And uh, of course, whether or not you're a winner or loser also depends on whether you have, keeping on the hydrology theme, whether you have an abundance of water in today's climate, or whether you have too little water in today's climate. So. To the extent that I'm answering your question, yes, we do recognize that the effects of climate change and the impacts of climate change are not going to be uniform throughout the world. There are going to be important regional differences. Yes. Thank you. Um, earlier on, Dr. Uh, Mullen no, was speaking. Identify yourself, please. Oh, sure. My name is Siddharth Nag. I'm on the uh, Committee on Resources in the House side. Uh, Dr. Malman earlier on spoke about the enormity of the global warming challenge in terms of abating or uh, mediating a lot of the uh, outputs. Um, and we've been speaking a lot here, I should say you guys have been speaking a lot here about the linkage between media and the science that's being generated, but we haven't spoken a whole lot, I know it's been touched upon a few times, about the link between the consumers every day sorts of the microeconomic levels. Um, we talk, you know, saying about macroeconomics and microeconomic levels um, between media, consumers, science. And um, Dr. Malman said, for instance, he said, you know, the problem, the normity was so large. Individual acts like recycling, it's going to take more than just small acts. And I mean, I, I agree. And um, there's, a, there's a point for large-scale change. Um, but I also was wondering, is there a utility in science journalism 
for looking at the sort of quotidian microeconomics. Like I've got this article here from ABC News. It says, meat eaters aiding global warming, question mark. And it's a, kind of an interesting article. And I just happened to catch it yesterday while uh, passing by a colleague's desk. And one of the great little sub headlines here is eating red meat like driving an SUV. I mean, are there sorts of ways in which the news media can creatively tie in everyday actions that we have to the larger picture of global warming to invest people in the problem more largely? Um, and I think it, there's also perhaps a second use in that, in that when you talk about individu investing individual actors in global warming, it helps circumvent the debate a little bit about whether or not global warming is real because you know, you can still question, say, after reading this article, well, do I believe in global warming? But it kind of assumes that already. It kind of says global warming is happening and we as humans have a part in it because our everyday actions have a part in it. Is there a role in the news journalism? And just as a quick final point, um, this article was generated off of a study done by two scientists at the University of Chicago, two um, assistant professors in geophysics. So I think that would be the tie with the science community as well. So sorry if I threw out a pretty <coughs> large question out there. Jim, well, um, well, clearly, I think there is a, you know, that is something that journalists sh should be covering, and I think they are covering. I mean, I've seen a lot of articles about what practical steps individuals can do in a variety of news, news articles. There are organizations correct me if I have the name right, Center for a New American Dream, that are, that are talking about consumption, reducing consumption patterns, partly for climate change issues. Uh, so I think some of that is being reported. Well, and one thing, I mean, what's, what's appealing about that, and I took note of that when I, actually there was a story w weeks ago about the same thing, is um, it reveals the carbon intensity, or the energy intensity of our lives. You know, it's the fertilizer that goes into the wheat, that goes into the grain, or whatever that goes into the cow. And, and the more that we can do to unravel for people to educate, <laughs> illuminate, whatever you want to call it, um, invisibilities that, are, that matter, um, meaning this is why your life, this is why America or, and or other industrialized countries have such a profound role here because we, everything you do, including the steak you ate as opposed to tofu, which also has, you know, or did your Fiji, wa you know, your Fiji water that came from Fiji, <laughs> hello, <laughs> in a ship across an ocean, uh, th there's, there's ways to get at that that are creative and get people's attention. And it all, some of that has to do with labeling. There's things you can do. It takes work. It's hard, though, to try to <clears throat> reveal. And sometimes we need scientists' help doing that. Sometimes we need an NGO's help doing that to unravel. So what is the carbon cost of this hamburger? You know, let's do that. Uh, that that's, uh, those are totally doable and interesting stories. Let's go here, and then there are two in the back, and then you. Go on. Thank you. I'm John McCormick with the Energy Policy Center. And it's a question to Jim. I want to go back to your comment on news beats. I believe the business page is a very prime target for uh, more, how do I say it, uh, engaging discussion about climate change, global warming within the investment and business community. My view is in the United States and probably around the world, we're seeing a very significant global warming policy decision, and it's being driven by the insurance industry looking at risk. Now, when I consider uh, Archer Daniels Midland and Cargill and other grain companies, you know, really not looking at the long-term future of the, the North American grain basket and the change in precipitation patterns, shipping companies who rely upon the uh, the level of the Great Lakes, even the Ohio River. I mean, th these are stories that are today. There's already concern about dr drawdown of the Colorado River and I guess the fantasy land of Las Vegas. You know, does it have a future? So if if investment community, venture capitalists who really read the, the that business section because that's their future um, were given more information about prospective risks, maybe there'd be some other changes besides the insurance industry. Well, I mean, I absolutely agree. And I know some, some news organizations have uh, business writers that specialize in environmental topics like that. Uh, when I was at the Philadelphia Inquirer, we had one of our, one of our business writers just focused on the environmental 
uh, impacts on business and a variety of things like that. I don't know if actually that beat still exists anymore, but, but, um, but yeah, I think that's a really rich area to look at. I, I remember one of our workshops when Andy Revkin volunteered at the New York Times, which frankly is probably ahead of most other news organizations in this area, but he said they were just getting to the point where they were breaking down the stovepipes between beats. And if they're just getting to that point now, and I'm sure that's still a work in progress, uh, much of the other news organizations, I mean, his comment about covering buildings is great. You know, in Washington, you cover buildings. You cover EPA or you cover FDA or you cover NIH. You know, you don't cover the issue. You don't go from there to Capitol Hill, back to the interest groups and so forth. And it's, it's a real problem in the way a lot of news organizations are set up. But that um, Ines Fuentes at the American Geophysical Union. Um, I'm the education person at AGU right now. I'm a seismologist by training, and in fact, what I studied was um, the largest, Earth's largest recorded earthquake, the great 1960 Chilean earthquake. And when the earthquake in Indonesia happened, I thought, why, why did all these people die? We knew the, the science we knew. I mean, we knew. Mag you get a magnitude 9 tsunami, uh, earthquake in a subduction zone, you're going to have a huge tsunami. And so my question is, what is the role of um, a scientific society like AGU? I mean, much of the research on all these questions we actually publish in our journals. What is our role? I mean, we're a group of, what, 40,000 scientists all over the world working on many of these issues. What, sh what can we do? What should we be doing here? I mean, we do, part of our job is to educate. Um, so what can we do more than we already do? Let me give you one quick suggestion. I don't know if this is an answer, but this is an idea that my colleague, uh, Tony Sochi, has been championing for some time. Uh, what would it be like if the presidents of AGU, AAAS, American Meteorological Society, uh, National Academy of Sciences, uh, went to the National Press Club, along with the presidents of uh, Society of Environmental Journals, National Association of Science Writers, uh, Jim Dutchin from the Knight Center, the only endowed chair, uh, Len Downey of the Washington Post, uh, Bill Keller of the New York Times. What if they went to the National Press Club and say, hey folks, there's a problem. The problem is us and the way we're communicating science. And uh, we as scientists and we as journalists uh, think there are ways that we can address this issue and get on top of this. It's going to take time. It's not going to be easy. The press is independent and free. But we can respect all those traditions and still do this. So maybe at some point we'll see that coming together. Maybe that's one small thing they could do. The other thing, you know, I, I, there was reference today, I, I don't know who made it, but somebody referred to when, when there will be next Carl Sagan. Um, at many of our workshops, I, I heard the line from scientists uh, frequently saying, you know, I don't, uh, or their colleagues, actually, they were paraphrasing what their colleagues say, is, you know, they don't want to become the next Carl Sagan, God forbid, you know. Well, who will, you know? Um, so, uh, I mean, the stigma uh, that's attached from the academy, the science academy and the institutions, I mean, you don't get tenure from going out and talking to the San Diego Union Tribune, you know? Uh, so, so there are things that the professional societies can do. Wouldn't it be neat if they could all come together and do it with journalism societies hand in hand? I, I just have a thought about uh, the professional organizations as well. And uh, uh, I think one question that I would have and I, I think I, I have a feel for the answer for the American Meteorological Society. Uh, the AGU is a little bit more complicated. It's a large organization. But I think it would be very interesting to know um, to what extent the rank and file membership of these professional organizations are actually well informed about climate change. Because my experience with people in the American Meteorological Society, especially those who are focused more on weather than on climate, but even among some people who are focused on climate at shorter time scales, is that they are relatively uninformed about climate change. And so if the members of our professional societies, you know, we would expect that if they are poorly informed, we can't expect the general public as a whole to be much better <laughs> informed than they are. So why is it that they are so poorly informed? It may be that as professional societies, uh, there still is a lot of uh, uh, subcultures within those professional societies that don't communicate with one another very well. I'd, I'd just like to add to that. I mean, I would like to see uh, 
First of all, you have to understand, most editors at most news media and news organizations in this country, first of all, very, very few, a tiny fraction, maybe even less, I mean, come out of science backgrounds. Most of them are backgrounds in politics, maybe police reporting, but usually politics, and they've gone up the, the uh, advanced up the, uh, the ranks. Uh, so they're not familiar with science <coughs> issues. And so I would, the more that uh, scientists can make the effort to meet with editors one-on-one, -on -one, just change minds that, are, you know, just go, you can go schedule some times, go meet with the, with the editors, the editorial boards, talk about issues, but really get out and do that. Uh, um, the other thing is I'd love to see just more interactions between the professional societies, AGU and American Meteorological Society and the Society of Environmental Journalists, the National Association of Science Writers, you know, really figure out more ways to bridge those gaps, to work together, to understand the different cultures, figure out ways to work, uh, you know, establish programs at universities. I mean, a big, a big issue to me is that until people at universities, scientists get tenure, they're very much afraid to, to speak out, okay? So, and this is a long-term process, but change, if you can change some of the tenure policies, where meeting with journalists uh, is valuable, uh, uh, you know, speaking out, being publicly involved, as opposed to just doing research and teaching, you know, the more that you can break down that, the more likely you'll get people willing to talk. Before you, before you make your question, may I, may I just say one thing on that? Um, the, um, a point that came up at our workshops was that newsrooms are going to have to develop expertise or capability uh, in science, in covering science. And um, there are two ways to do it. One is they can do it internally within the newsroom. Uh, given what we heard about the economics of this, this industry, and the business and the tra trajectory it's headed, that's not likely to happen. Uh, what could happen is that they could develop uh, these mentors, these science mentors, beyond the university, whether it's in uh, uh, universities or beyond the newsroom, whether it's in universities or wherever, the kind of thing Andy mentioned earlier. That's, that's another role where the scientific societies could be extremely helpful. Because one way or the other, they're gonna have to do it. Corey Dean, from the science editor of the New York Times, was at her first workshop, and she, she told a great story. She said that, you know, and she had the, the best science, science uh, section in the country, the largest science section in the country in terms of reporters and everything else. She had scientists come to her and say, you know, you should require that every reporter on your science desk has a PhD. And, and believe me, their resources aren't good enough to do that. You know what her answer was? Two word answer, in what? <laughs> a great, just a great answer. The, the other thing I want to touch on real briefly, and I'm this, a little bit reluctant to do this, but Jim mentioned editors. I do want to get in this shot at editors. Um, uh, the current Columbia Journals Review, July, August, has an article, uh, and I just want to read you three sentences. Uh, editors, they're accustomed to being smart, but they can't deal with the fact that they don't understand science. Because they're uncomfortable feeling confused, readers are left in the dark about a universe of research that eludes easy explanation. Next sentence. Editors, they tend to be very accomplished people. They're used to being the smartest guys in the room. So science makes them squirm. Because they can't bear to feel dumb, science coverage suffers. And final one. Then there's the ambiguous fact that data are always to some extent ambiguous. Good si but good scientists understand that if they're not dealing with subject matter that makes them dizzy, they're probably not doing their jobs. It's essential to know not only what scientists know, but also what they don't know. This is an unfamiliar concept to editors used to dealing with politics or sports. Because Jim's absolutely correct. The science desk is not the career path to becoming editor or top editor of the newspaper. It's usually politics or economics, not science. Um, Andy had a comment, did you, or was it Ben? Uh, not an answer to your question, but just a quick comment. Uh, AGU, about a year ago, did uh, come up with some position statement on climate change and affirmed the reality of human-induced climate change and affirmed that it was a serious problem worthy of all of our attention. So they're to be congratulated for doing that. 
Thank you for your patience, and after you, Jerry. Um, Mike McCracken from the Climate Institute. Um, the tradition in science has been to assume that things are natural until proven otherwise. Um, <clears throat> with climate change sort of, uh, humans proven pretty well to uh, be shown that they're changing the climate, that, that's become quite problematic, it seems to me. I mean, Paul Crutzen has even commented we're in the Anthropocene. And the, I guess there were two issues raised today where it seems to me there's a, a bit too much acceptance being given of the things that it's natural. One has to do with the hurricane discussion where we've been in a time when humans are affecting the climate and a lot of things that affect hurricanes is going to potentially a human influence. And the basis for assuming that there is not human influence has been is, is rather weak in some sense, so that the presumption is sort of a weak one. The, the same one sort of concerns Greenland and how long it may take to melt. I mean, there's interesting evidence around also that it may, may occur more rapidly. And if you ask back and try and probe, well, what is the basis for saying that it might take millennia, as Andy was commenting, that's very weak evidence from rather simple kinds of representations of things. So it seems to me that Actually, reporters yeah. are going to have to take on asking both sides to support their positions, not just the presumption that it's natural. You're, you're looking at me. I mean, Andy, there's, there's, if you drill down in the ice in southern Greenland, there isn't old ice before the Emian. Mm -hmm. I mean, it isn't there. And there's but indications the of sea level of change, higher. But you don't know the pace of change before either. In other words, but you see, what you've done, let me just get back to my article in April, which was essentially questioning this, I don't know if you want to call it a strategy, but, but the approach that journalism, meaning Time Magazine and some others, and, and some of the documentaries, including the Al Gore documentary and book, took to the issue, which is to take the here and now thing. Right now, there's the melting zone in Greenland has been increasing in summers and um, make it into a here and that's it. It's the smoking gun. Greenland's going because Jay Zwally has notice that you can get faster motion when you have melting on the surface. And that, but, that, but Greenland is not that simple. It's not that simple. At least is, I mean, I've been writing about Greenland now for years. And suppose all that meltwater chills that you get colder water, fresh water around Greenland, shuts down the warmer currents, and Greenland gets cold again. I mean, isn't that part of what can happen? Greenland can kill, cool itself down. <laughs> it can cool itself down. Yeah. Well, can it or can it? I mean, I don't want to get bogged down here. I mean, this is, <laughs> this is welcome to my world. <laughs> we're, we're, in real, we're in real danger of, of illustrating the, the difference between the culture of science and other cultures here. Right. Because no one sitting at this table is really an expert on glaciology and the feedbacks. And that's, by the way, that's one of the, the morals of my story lately on this issue after writing about it for 20 years is that there isn't a science, scientist who has become outspoken on what to do about global warming who understands all of the facets of global warming science. It is, it is everything. It's glaciology, it's physics, it's atmospheric chemistry, it's oceanography, and it's biology, and, and beyond. I mean, on and on and on. And there is no one from Jim Hansen on down who can speak with authority about how this is going to play out without getting into a morass of, <clears throat> of possibilities. And that's the danger. If you take the focus away from the middle of that big bulge of what we know, toward the things that are more I, I guess I'm than just, we get into I, this I was funny just trying place. to say, be careful of your presumptions in saying what we know, though, I think, because on, on these topics, there is sometimes little information on both sides. This idea that hurricanes have had natural cycles in the past is, is very flimsy support, in, in, yeah, absolutely. I think many people say. And so you have to be very careful about saying, whether it was natural. And by the way, that's why I ran the story in the Science Times today where these 10 scientists on both sides of that issue signed a common letter saying this is all a distraction from the most important issue for America related to hurricanes, which is we're building too much stuff on coasts. Hmm. Jerry, uh, you want a quick comment? Yeah, just a quick comment, Mike. I, I agree with you. Uh, I think there's compelling observational, theoretical, and modeling evidence of a link between <clears throat> increasing ocean surface temperatures and hurricane intensity. Uh, now, people may quibble about how strong that linkage is, but uh, even someone like 
Chris Lancy, I think, accepts that at some level there is a relationship there. And if you go back then and look at the causes of ocean surface temperature changes in these regions where um, Atlantic and Pacific uh, hurricanes and typhoons form, then it's pretty clear that uh, natural variability alone ch just won't cut it. <laughs> it uh, doesn't come anywhere near explaining the observed increases in ocean surface temperature that we've seen over the 20th century. So do I think that there's uh, a serious, potentially serious problem there that we really need to uh, uh, better understand? You, you bet. <laughs> On the Greenland issue, um, I, I think we do know that uh, uh, this melt zone is increasing. Some of that melt water is being channeled to the bedrock on which the ice rests. The ice albedo is changing. You're getting, as Jim Hansen has showed, this deposition uh, of the outputs of <coughs> industrial society, even on the, what you might think were the, the pristine surfaces of, uh, of Greenland and bits of Antarctica. And that changes the albedo. You absorb more incoming solar radiation. You accelerate heating. These things are worrying to me. <laughs> they really are because uh, you, you know you, you, the the growth of these ice sheets is a very slow process, occupying millennia. Our best understanding from paleoclimate data is that the removal of the ice sheets is a much faster process, and we're fooling around with that removal process now. Mm. I, I would just just add uh, as a brief summary that when it comes to the subject of uncertainties about how climate change will evolve, it's important to remember that the uncertainties can cut both ways. Very often in these discussions, there's an almost implicit assumption that the uncertainties may make the problem less formidable than it appears. But to the extent that our estimates are unbiased, there's also the possibility that they will make the problem more severe than it currently appears. And so that's something we need to bear in mind when we talk about uncertainties. Jerry. Yeah, there's uh, several things that I think need to be mentioned that we haven't mentioned in this particular panel. Uh, one is we have <coughs> taken a completely anthropocentric view of the climate system and the Earth system, where we live with all the other countless species that on Earth, many of which are already being driven to extinction, uh, largely because of land use problems. And another politically incorrect thing to say is exploding global population, which we're on a trajectory to 9 billion people or something like that. So to me, these two mega issues are convoluted into the whole question of global warming at the same time. I appreciate comments from the panel about that. <clears throat> Yeah, I'd, I'd like to comment on the first uh, point, this issue of cohabiting the planet with many other species. And this relates, too, to the issue of ocean acidification and potentially injurious uh, effects of uh, an acidifying ocean on the marine biota <laughs> uh, that uh, you know, much of life depends upon. And uh, I think one point worth mentioning there is that you know there there have been so, some suggestions that geoengineering can solve all of these problems. Okay, uh, let's let's assume that at some point in the future we arrive at some uh, decision on the part of our political leaders. Yeah, we've got to do something about it. Let's inject dust up into the stratosphere and artificially cool down the planet, or put lots of reflective little balloons out there. Uh, those sorts of solutions don't address ocean acidification. <laughs> that has to be said, okay? So uh, their attempts to, uh, uh, you know, artificially reduce the amount of solar radiation that hits the Earth's surface, but they do nothing about drawing down levels of atmospheric CO2. <laughs> so some of these, you know, grand geoengineering strategies don't get at the first part of your, your question. Uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a real serious one. We, are, we have just about 10 minutes left. Uh, you had a question, then you in the back. David Blockstein with National Council for Science and the Environment. I appreciate the discussion, which has largely focused on communication between scientists and journalists, but it's not a conversation that takes place in a vacuum. And as you know, that... Uh, 
part of the reason why scientists are very reluctant is that they're, in this issue and many other environmental issues, they're well-financed oppositions, and many of the people in this room uh, bear a lot of scars from the opposition that every time you speak out that there are well-financed, industry-supported spokesmen, the climate deniers, et cetera. And I, I heard one of your colleagues uh, from ABC News uh, talk recently and said, you know, for 20 years, the news media has basically been asleep, um, lulled by this, this uh, corporate campaign. And, and so I guess what I'm proposing is that this isn't just a story about science communication. It's not issues that are going to be just addressed by the science journalists, but there's a bigger story here. And, and I'm wondering how you see the media addressing that bigger story. Can I respond? I, I, I think uh, there are some people in this room, uh, too, who are great investigative journalists who are getting <laughs> at some of these uh, tenuous linkage and sometimes not so tenuous links between uh, some of the uh, you know folks out there, denialists, skeptics, contrarians, and, uh, and, and industry. Uh, I think a lot more can can and should be done on those issues. As N Naomi pointed out this morning, uh, sometimes it's the same cast of characters who've been involved in you know many uh, of these environmental debates uh, for for decades now, and yet they're still perceived as as reasonable as. Uh, 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 go-to guys or, 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 or women on, on climate change related issues and that seems to me just plain plain wrong. The, the public needs the and policymakers need the best available scientific information on climate change, what we know about it, what we don't know about it and they're, they're not getting it from these people. <laughs> they're really not getting it. We're doing our government a disservice by allowing these folks to have such tremendous access to them. Some of the people mentioned here today, I know, have entree at the highest levels of government. Uh, you know, we live in, in a country where Michael Crichton can go and visit the White House and talk to the president about climate change, a science fiction writer. I'm sure none of us <laughs> will ever have the opportunity to talk to uh, the president of the United States uh, on climate change related issues and to tell him what we know and uh, what we don't know and why we think it's important. That's a travesty. I, I, if I could just add, I think we have to be a little careful, though, about getting too carried away with respect to the qualities of the messenger as opposed to the message, because that is not without its downsides also. Uh, I guess in one of these press releases, maybe it was from, uh, from the uh, Senate uh, Energy Committee, uh, I'm not sure. I was reading uh, criticisms of one of the people who appeared in Tom Brokaw's special, uh, Michael Oppenheimer from, from Princeton University, uh, including a long list of uh, whose political campaigns he had contributed to and what organizations he had supported financially. And so I think if we try to make judgments about uh, the credibility of scientists based on some of these other things, there is a danger there that that can just be a messy food fight in which everybody comes out as the loser. I think that there are other things that good journalists are well qualified to assess that are better ways of assessing the credibility of scientists. Do they publish research on this topic in peer-reviewed journals? Just because somebody has a PhD, maybe even in, an, in a relevant field, what are their papers about? Are there papers about what has happened lately in the climate of a particular state? Or are they really trying to understand global climate change? So I, I think rather than get into long um, sidetracks about the motivations of the messengers, it's important to focus on what their message is and whether or not their message is credible. I think we really have time for only one more question. I know in the back you've been waiting a while. No? Uh, do you have a question? Yes. Since a lot of the impacts of climate change are going to affect 
some of the poorer people in this country and around the world. I was just wondering how you felt the media, or maybe scientists too, could broaden discussion to include a lot of people who are, I mean, if you look around this room, a lot of people who are not necessarily that involved with climate change issues. That made sense. Well, I'll take a quick stab. I had the opportunity a few years ago to give a couple of talks to uh, groups of uh, union workers, blue collar workers in some of the traditional industrial unions as part of something that was called the Blue Green Alliance. And it was a very interesting opportunity because what I found, now of course the audience was self-selected, the people who came were people who were interested in this topic, but what I found was there was a lot of interest because of precisely the point that you mentioned, that a lot of the impacts of climate change are going to be felt more severely by people without the financial means to adapt and adjust. So I think there have been some efforts in that direction. We, uh, we really do need to break. Um, let, me, let me say a couple real quick things. I'm afraid almost these might sound like a plug, but uh, Jerry Malman raised the politically incorrect uh, subject of population. I can tell Jerry that there's no issue the media uh, like more to avoid than a population. SEJ at a recent annual meeting uh, did a plenary session they called Taboo Topics and population was the president of the class. So it is a very, very tough issue for media to address. Um, so there are some real problems there. Uh, secondly, this is gonna sound like a plug. Um, the comment about working with editors. Uh, my colleague and I, uh, Sunshine, um, my, my colleague and I at Metcalf are engaged in a, a project. Um, it, it's, a, it's called the Grantham Prize for excellence in reporting on the environment. If you can believe it, it's literally the largest uh, dollar award for any journalism prize in the world. Uh, it's in its first year, we'll announce the winner next, uh, in September. Um, but uh, it's a $75,000 cash award for a single journalist, for a single piece of uh, writing on, on environment and natural resources. Its message is intended to send, uh, send a message to editors that this beat is important. Uh, the people value it, uh, newsrooms should value it, and there's a lot to be said for doing good investigative quality environmental journalism. Um, we are going to, as part of that, bring into um, a meeting uh, top editors, and these are top editors and news directors from TV stations uh, from around the country, to expose them to some high quality environmental journalism. Uh, including uh, coverage of, of issues like this one we've been discussing today. So that's one effort. Uh, I know Tony is working in, in, with other several partner groups to uh, carry this message forward to editors, because that is a critical need, and it's one we've been challenged to, to meet yet. So there are efforts also uh, to, to go up and, and reach top editors. Um, the comment on population is going to sound like a plug for the Wilson Center, but the Environmental Change and Security Program, who's hosting us today, has invited in today uh, two journalists, um, one from Tanzania and one from India, sitting right here, uh, and they will be discussing whether the model that we have been doing on climate change with climate science and journalists applies or can apply to coverage of population, health, and environment at an international level. So that's one project the, the Wilson Center is very interested in pursuing and is, is beginning to do some really creative things. And so there are some things happening there. Um, I want to ask Tony if he has any concluding remarks. Uh, we're about six minutes from the breakup. I do want to save time for Andy Revkin to sign a few uh, for sale books. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, a message from your sponsor. Um, uh, which will be right outside the door. And Andy's got a four o'clock meeting that he's got to uh, be at. Um, so um, we're gonna break sharply at 3.30. That'll give Andy at least 15 minutes. And I tell him he can still get a cab up there in 15 minutes. Tony, did you have something you wanna add? Um, I just wanted to close off the discussion. Tony. Where? I wanted to close off the discussion a little bit on the uh, role of professional science societies and journalism societies. <clears throat> Um, I think Bud and I have talked about this quite a bit, but they've always had the um, 
the asset of having large memberships composed of professionals in both cultures and basically have some influence on curricula. And we think there might be um, some interesting uh, possibilities with cross offerings between journalism schools and science schools. Taking a cue, for example, from the professional science societies. In other words, driving this issue of communication down through the ranks, through the uh, university systems and so on and so forth. I think there's lots of opportunities out there, but it has to be driven. The, actually, I'll just say one quick thing along those lines. I forgot to tell you, I don't know if you noticed, the website I put up before for, for me was nytimes.com slash learning. For all those who wonder about that question of whether journalism is an education-oriented medium, the Times, realizing in the 21st century that you know we have to reinvent everything, uh, essentially, um, there's a lot of outreach to classrooms generally. We have a whole set of curricula there that are developed with universities uh, for high school students and a separate one, nytimes.com slash college for universities. So it's all happening. In fact, I'm going to a meeting next week with a bunch of university provosts to talk about ways to do this. So it's in everyone's interest. Yeah, I think the Times recently bought or purchased about.com. And that sent a signal to throughout a lot of the newspaper business that uh, we, we do have to do some educating. Um, just as the time sets a pattern when it uh, cuts its column, its, its uh, broadsheet, it also uh, sets a, sends a message when it purchases about.com and has a website like that. I'm going to go out on a limb. Maybe this, is, this audience is self-selected since you stayed throughout the whole day. But I'm going to ask you, I've given you a couple um, URLs to write down. I'm going to ask you to write down one uh, email address. Uh, and I should have cleared this with him before I did this, but I, um, I, I'm about not to have done that. Uh, I'm going to ask you to write down the email address D, as in David, D Verardo, V E R A R D O, at nsf.gov, and tell him whether or not you think this was worthwhile. Tell him you, whether or not you think this is a good investment on NSF's part. And if you think so, tell him. And if you think it's not, please tell him. Yes, D V E R A R D O at nsf.gov. So just send, send him an email and tell him your reaction to the day. Uh, I, I want to thank the what, Wilson. What's his first name? Dave. Dave. Okay. I, I want to thank uh, the Wilson Center. Um, we are planning, uh, there were a couple comments earlier about this is a culmination. We think not. Uh, we think it's a, a long term process we're in for. Uh, we do want to move forward with editors and news directors. We do plan also to produce, whether it's a book or a report, uh, it'll be major, we hope, uh, based on the discussions that we've had throughout this, all of the workshops. Uh, so that will be in the future. The website will be uh, up that uh, Jeff DeBelco mentioned earlier in a week or so. And um, I hope you'll stay tuned, because we, th we hope there'll be more coming on this kind of project. Thank you so much for your attendance and interest.